Now Sweeney. Dwayne Sweeney. Sweeney's over. Can you please hand it over to your captain, Dwayne Sweeney? Welcome to Real Tales with Sweens. This episode, I chat with Troy Flavel. Troy is an ex-professional rugby player who played 22 tests for the All Blacks, represented New Zealand Sevens, New Zealand Māori, played his provincial rugby for North Harbour in Auckland, Super Rugby for the Chiefs and the Blues, and he also spent some time playing offshore, where he played for Toyota and Mitsubishi in Japan, and then went on to finish his professional career playing for Bayonne in the south of France. More recently, Troy has been one of the stars in the new hit TV show Matchfit. Matchfit was a show based here in New Zealand where some ex All Black rugby stars showed how important it was to maintain a healthy lifestyle. In doing so, some of the ex stars showed some amazing vulnerability as they shared their personal struggles. Troy is a very charismatic person and has a great nature, and he shares some great tales with us. From what it was like to be a part of Matchfit, taking on Willie Mason in Fight for Life, a charity boxing event, the early days of professional rugby and his passion for fishing. We also share how special the New Zealand Māori team culture is to us and what it was like to play professionally in Japan and how we found the Japanese culture. Troy also gives great insight into his time in France and so much more. As always, the show notes will be available on Instagram at Real Tales with Sweens and the website realtaleswithsweens.com. The website has all the links to listen on your favourite platform and some great content on all the guests. As Good George Brewing has partnered the podcast, all of the listeners will receive 10% off on your online purchases. Just enter the discount code REALTALES before checking out. Lastly, I want to thank Troy for sharing his tale. It was an absolute pleasure to sit down with you, mate. Thanks for listening and enjoy the podcast. Sweet. Sweet. Pretty good setup. Yeah. All right, so I'm just sitting here with Troy Flavel, All Black number 990. Nice to be here, sweet. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you very much for making the effort to come down. Um, we've actually got a bit of a Christmas due for the podcast tonight at Good George, so yeah, you're I've pretty t- keen to come down. Mate, I've timed that well, haven't I? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've timed it well. And the, and the surf's up tomorrow at Raglan Yes, too. yeah, surf's pumping at Raglan tomorrow, which is just down the road from your place. So I've uh, got the board on top and, um, yeah, ripping to it tomorrow. Nice, nice. I suppose just to kick it off, I remember playing against you when I first sort of came on the scene. You probably don't remember too much of me, but I definitely knew who you were. And I remember your haircut. Yeah, <laughs> <your> terrible haircut. <laughs> <laughs> we were just talking about those, weren't we? Yeah, I don't know, probably had a rat's tail or something back then, a bit of a scucky as mohawk. But yeah, and then lucky enough, I, well, you know, obviously we're rivals right through my career, and I'm not a big fan of the Blues, North Harbour or Auckland who you played for, but then was fortunate enough to play alongside you in the Pack the Park game down in Invercargill. Yeah. And it's amazing how you can go your whole career, play against these people, and you have, like an, like you do, you have an opinion on someone through, I guess, being enemies in terms of teams. Yeah. But it's not until you actually get to know that person that you actually have a real understanding of, of who they are. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah mm-hmm. mate. And... Uh... One thing I found, yeah, and I know exactly what you're saying there, and, but one the one thing I have found, yeah, and this is international, uh, even with you know international players, um, we're all very like minded, um, and generally we've got the same sort of disciplines, the same sort of um, outlook on life. Um, I've, I've found uh, with the guys I've sort of um, met over the years, either in a, in, in a playing capacity or outside of you know like yourself, you know. Mm. Um, you know, you, you 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 fall into these games like Pack the Park, where um, you know you, you've played against these guys all your life, like you, like you say, and um, you know you always have your opinion of them. But mm. it's not until you, um, you know, I, I guess the the uh, the pressure of high level rugby goes off mm. to, to one side, you know, and you can uh, start talking about things like life, mate, and. Um, you know, what's that like for you and how, how's life these days and what are you up to and you know you so you get start to build a bit of a rapport with these guys and uh get on a bit more of a personal level yeah yeah well and you know there's no after matches anymore either you know in professional rugby so you lose that part of it too where i assume in the early days and like it is at club rugby you have after matches so you spend that time post the game off field talking about things like that but yeah. with 
professional rugby and playing at seven thirty at night, and yeah. you're not going to have a after match at bloody eleven o'clock by the time you shower up and get up there. Sometimes, yeah, then you you miss that connection, and it just becomes the rivalry on the field. Yeah. And unless you make an international team or a rep team like the New Zealand Maldives or the All Blacks or Sevens or something where you get to play alongside them be in their team, then yeah. you get a better understanding of the person, yep. then that's where friendships are formed, eh? Yeah, Otherwise that's Otherwise right. it stays the rivalry junior, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and like, man, I kicked off early. I, you know, I started in 97, 97? 97, yeah. So um, professional rugby was in its infancy, you know, mm-hmm. and, and we would we, we would have a beer after the game, you know, at, 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 even at super level. Uh, would have a beer after the game and get to know these guys on a very personal level. But um, in my later years, like in you know when I started playing Super Fifteen, you know in my early thirties, uh, it was very much you know we're having a power raid and we're on the bus and we're out here, you know. Mm. So you never you never got to spend that time with um, uh, with with the opposition at all. Yeah, mm. yeah. Well, that that I want to talk a little bit about the pack the park and what an awesome concept that. It, was a eh, and what a wicked event! Like I, I, I saw because how it happened for me is I saw it sort of pop up in um, Sumo Stevenson's Instagram feed, and I was like, "Man, this looks like a bit of me. I would love to be involved in something like this." So I flicked him a message and like, "How do I get involved in this?" Yeah, and then he passed me on to Flinny, and then yeah, and then away we went. Then I ended up talking to Missy, and then next minute I'm I'm booked in and going down, and I didn't really know what to expect. But yeah. then when I got there and seen the magnitude of the event and how yep. many people got in behind it i was yep. really really glad that i reached out to to be involved because i loved it eh? yeah and, and to, to your credit mate uh, not many people do that you know uh, a lot of guys you know at our um, my lovely mature age um <laughs> you know there's a there's sort of a handful of guys that work that circuit so to speak mm. um you know we go to all the bar bars games um you know there's probably about sort of 10 of us 10 sort of core guys and we get the phone call all the time you know mm. which is which is great like i love being a part of it and i'm still able to play so why mm. not play um <clears throat> but then we have there's always a few new guys that come along you know yeah. and you know you came along this year and that, that was bloody awesome mate and uh uh just me new guys and uh yeah now that obviously the pressures of rugby have, have fallen fallen to the side to the wayside now um you can start and just enjoying having a beer and mm. playing 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 the sport we love for for an amazing event. Uh, Missy did an outstanding, um, put, you know, that the, the whole weekend from from start to finish, as you know, was just outstanding. You mate, and the uh, the post event um, after the game, but the whole the whole city got on board. Yeah, all of them, the cargo got on board. Mm. You know, all the locals, all the the local business dealers. Um, mm. Yeah, just made the whole event and the whole weekend um, that much better, you know. It was great. Yeah, yeah, no, it was... I couldn't get over... Like, I had no idea what we were walking to, into for the post-event. Did you <laughs> Did you think it was going to be like that? Oh, hell no. <laughs> I thought hell we no. were going to... There was going to be... Um, no. Like, like the breakfast yeah. that we went to. I oh, thought awesome. there'd be half a dozen tables. And, yeah. yeah. It was so nice. <laughs> so nice. Like, we had power fritters, as you know. We had, like, power fritters for breakfast. Yeah. Went to half the game, you know. Yeah, guys, were, yeah, half a, yeah, a few cans. Everyone was, like, farting and carrying on the bus. And, <laughs> yeah. yeah, never feed a married powers, you know. Yeah. Um, and, but then when we were here, yeah, that post-event, the, yeah. the after-match, mate, it was like we won the World Cup, eh? Yeah, like, yeah. It, was, it was full on. Uh, just, uh, yeah, great weekend. Yeah, no, it was wicked, man. I loved it. It was so much fun. And talking about you still playing at your age and and being involved in those events, like you were on fire that day. Um, <laughs> you know, still running around like you could be playing Mitre 10 Cup, no worries. And Ali was pretty uh, pretty chuffed with himself too. Right? Yeah, he was he, handy he, as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he was telling everyone that he was making a comeback. and <laughs> <laughs> He was like, shit, I was good, eh, Sweets? <laughs> oh, mate, he wasn't saying that on the Sunday, though, I'll tell you. Yeah, yeah, he ripped his bicep tendon. That's right. Yeah, so that, that was... Ali's that was actually Ali's first game since he's finished playing, you know, yep. professionally, and um, <laughs> and he was playing to his credit, he was playing really well. But mm. then he um, tore his bicep tendon that day. Yeah, 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 a few little grubber kicks and yeah. the rest of it. Eh? Yeah, yeah, he's a he's a good like. See, Ali's another one. Like I never, you know, obviously I grew up here in the Waikato and playing for the Chiefs, and yep. oh, I hated the Blues, hated yep. Auckland, hated yep. Ali. Yep, for you know, like I would have hated you too. Well, I, <laughs> like, I can admit it now, um, but. And 
like I'm, I played with Vali and the Barbas yeah. and over in the UK, and I was just like, "This dude's the man!" Like yeah. he's, but it's just so funny how you have a perception of yeah. somebody, but it's not until and I've learned over time because people, it's the same for me. Like no doubt, there's people that have certain opinions of me, and I hear a lot of them through the mm. grapevine. Like he's arrogant, asshole, whatever mm. the rest of it. Mm. But it's like you never met that person, mm. so you don't actually know. You might not like the yeah. way that I play rugby or you play rugby or Ali plays rugby. Yeah, yeah. But go and get have a beer with the dude, yeah. talk to him, and they're like, yeah. oh, he's actually a good fella, and yeah. he likes what I like. He likes yeah. fishing, and he enjoys hunting. Oh, I've had that so many times. I've been in pubs and, you know, having a beer with a guy, you know, we were speaking for about half an hour, 40 minutes or whatever it is, mm. and, and then at the end of the 40 minutes, he goes, oh, you're actually a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Oh, cheers, man. Yeah, yeah. So are you? Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. What some people sort of forget is, yeah, you know, we're, we're just the same as everybody else, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. No, and then from that, um, match fit was like, you were you had already started training prior to that game, eh? Like for <clears throat> for the match fit, had you? No, no, no. no we haven't. Hadn't. Yeah. No, no. Uh, from the time we signed on for match. Fit until the time we started filming was yep. three to four weeks. Oh, okay. Yeah, yep. so it happened within a short period of time. Yep. Obviously due to COVID and and whatnot, and just the short time frames to you know find a slot before Christmas, etc. Um, <clears throat> but if, you know, from the moment we knew that we were signing on for that, um, a few guys started training. Like yep. like Krabby, for example, like he was one hundred and forty three clicks when he found out that he's yep. going to be on the show. He started losing weight then, yeah, and he got down to one thirty three or something, and then he got, okay, yeah. So he actually lost about ten kilos before he even came on the show, yeah. And then he continued to obviously um, progress and mm. uh, make those gains, but yeah. um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Well, it's a massive oh, the feedback that has come around, and like I talked to different people from outside of rugby circles, and that everyone loved it, eh? Like, yeah, and just seeing the vulner- vulnerability of the guys to go on and. You know, basically show all. Yeah. Like it's that's the hard thing to do, but easier for you in the nick that you're in. <laughs> but you know, like some yeah. of the some of the guys, was it for yeah. you? We we obviously because you didn't need to go on to to lose weight. It was more just around the awareness. Yeah, it was it. around the awareness. Um, for me personally, it was about giving support as well. Yep. For the guys who were going through that, you know, um, you know, sort of all in mentality. Um, obviously. Kirby and I grew up together as you know, since we were four year olds basically. So um, you know, we lived out of out of out of each other's houses and so so for me to be there and give him that support on a daily basis, you know, making him accountable for, you know, what he's putting in his mouth, what, what kind of training he's doing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, that that was that was priceless for me. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's pretty cool, eh? and it's a, like the rugby community is amazing for that. Yeah. Like uh, the friendships that you form through it, because you basically live in this like baptism of fire when you play professional rugby. Yeah. Like it's a, it's quite a small group, basically a squad that you deal with, yep. like on a daily basis. But the amount of pressure that comes from the outside in, and the just unawareness of the people on the outside to know what it's actually like on the inside. Yep you just form this like really, really close friendship and it, it's hard to kind of explain without being in it, eh? Yeah, yeah, it, it is. Well, we, what we do essentially is we isolate ourselves as well, though, you know, yeah. which, you know, for good or bad, you know, you do end up um, distancing yourself from the public. So there's always that persona of whether, you know, um, where, where are these guys being arrogant? Are they not, um, you know? Yeah. Do they think they're a bit better? Well, you know, ex, ex, yeah, it's a hard one to explain, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting one because you know you sort of have this isolated lifestyle, and then you you actually want that a little bit as well because you you know because you're in the public arena, mm. you want to distance yourself, and you know you, when you want family time, you know we're, we're here right now with your wife and kids, but you know as as you know in your playing days. You just want sometimes you want a little bit of distance. You just, you just want to be a little bit selfish and yeah. have your family to yourself and just just you know have a Sunday where you can just run around on the grass with your kids and do all that kind of stuff without being in the public eye and you know or go to a restaurant or whatever and just being a normal person rather yeah. than um, Dwayne Sweeney the rugby player. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. 
yeah because it's um yeah i don't know it, it is it's very it's just hard to explain eh, without yeah. sort of being in there and exactly that you might have a perception that somebody's arrogant and like, i know for a fact that people have thought that about me but yeah. i'm i was like the opposite i had like imposter syndrome i thought like <laughs> oh, i shouldn't be here you know hanging out with marty holler and johnny gibbs and yeah. those sort of names when i started because i grew up watching them as a kid yeah so i was just well you know like sort of my early teenagers teenage years when you're real impressionable and that's what you want to do and mm. you know you're starting to get excited about the big wide world and oh man you can be a professional rugby player now yeah. and then i'm watching these guys on tv and then at the age of 17 i'm alongside them it's like oh shit like <laughs> i shouldn't be here like yeah. yeah so you do you shout to yourself and you guard yourself off because you're actually trying to sort of hide your vulnerability that you're like well actually i shouldn't really be here but yeah. it's just it's more shyness than it is arrogance yeah and, and mate that's uh that's totally natural you know i yeah. think we all went through that you know at one mm. one point or the other um yeah, it's a, it's an interesting one, eh? Because you know you, you're trying to find your feet. It's like anything, you know. It's like a kid going to school for the first day, you know. Mm. He's, he's just trying to find your place in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think because or within the team, yeah, yeah, within yeah. the team or mm. society, eh? Like mm. everyone has the yep. exact same situation when they go to work. Yep. It's just not hundreds of thousands of people watching it mm. live. You mm. know, like you're doing when you turn up to a new accountancy job, there's not like, it's not live on TV mm. and then you mm. make a mistake and everyone goes, Oh, you should have done that spreadsheet <laughs> different. No. Yeah. Yeah. But I, you know, like, uh, unfortunately that's what we sign up for, you know? So yeah. You, yeah, you hear rugby players complain about that kind of stuff sometimes and, uh, you know, media, et cetera, et cetera, but it, it's part and parcel, you know? Yeah. And, um, some people can deal with that quite well mm. and some guys actually struggle with it, you know, yeah. And since I've been out of rugby, um, I've had some of those conversations with um, different different players over the years, and they're uh, some some people have really um, taken it quite heavy, you know. Mm. Mm. Yeah, but <clears> it's <throat> like like in New Zealand, we have I, I talk about this quite often with different people. Everybody in New Zealand's an expert of rugby because it's our national sport, and we live and breathe it. Like yep. I get told often, you know, at the petrol station or the supermarket by random people in the public there might be a 60 year old lady and she's like oh, i should have done this and she's right most of the time you know <laughs> because we yeah. we watch so much of it yeah. we're so invested in it because the country is so good at the sport but it's the reason like as players we need to understand the reason that we have a job is because our country is like that yeah if our country didn't give a shit about rugby then we yeah. wouldn't be yeah. professional rugby players yeah. you know like look how hard it is for the other sports in our country yeah. to be able to be pro because they don't have the investment of the public behind mm, them. So it's, mm. people aren't paying lots of money to watch it on TV, to sponsor teams, to yeah. go to live games like the rest of it. So yeah. we, we've got to understand that, yeah, we like there, there's pressure for that, but the only reason you have pressure is allowing you to be actu actually do that yeah. as a job. Yeah, and where we um, differentiate our... our um ourselves from other other international sides is you know or other countries is um we're very humble you know as kiwis we're mm. very humble mate we're, we're very approachable compared to other especially you now if you're talking about the all blacks you know like look at our all, our all blacks go deal with the public all the time and they're really good at it you know mm. um some some countries aren't like that no 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 well i've seen i noticed it it wasn't yeah when I went to overseas to Japan and then started dealing with some of the other international players from it, I was just like blown away. I was like, man, no wonder the All Blacks are so successful yeah. because like I wasn't an All Black. Yeah. But in terms of what I could deal with and the adaptability that I had from my career in New Zealand, yeah. like I was playing with Test Match Wallabies and Springboks, and yeah. I'm just like, mate, you wouldn't start my ten cup with the bad habits that you have. Very talented players, but I was like, there's two too much inconsistency or you rely solely on one thing like in New Zealand you can't do that yeah. because there's just someone else there that does everything and is committed and yeah. puts the time in and the effort and has the talent so it's like yeah it's a very hard way to the top mm. here mm. in New Zealand yep. yeah yeah man oh, the, you know, the pool of talent we have is huge mm. you know um, yeah, for such a small country yeah you know yeah. just pump them out yeah just, yeah it's crazy. You could yeah. probably strip 
bloody three All Black sides at a World Cup and yeah. probably all make the semi finals. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, yeah, if they got the, the yeah. they didn't meet each other on the yeah. way. Yeah. yeah. It's it's amazing, eh, how much talent there is. Yeah. Yeah. Um Yeah, you mentioned a little bit there, like the early days of pro rugby. Like I do want to talk about that. Like you kind of went into into it a little bit but go into it a bit more mm. you played super rugby in its second year like 1997 it only started in 96 yeah you know like that's just after the world cup when Joan Lomu went nuts in 95 like that's you know that's the glory days of well it was the infancy like you said mm. of professional rugby mm. what changed from there say 10 years later in 2007 when you're the captain for the blues yeah. and then that was my first year of super rugby right what what did you what was the big difference like in that time <sighs> wow mate. everything yeah. yeah absolutely everything you know like uh everything yeah every, every you know from the gm right down you know mm. right through the players coaching staff how they manage people um support off field support for players um is a big one um you know we we didn't have all that support wrapped around players like they do these days um you know you got uh enzo rpa that was also in its infancy in my sort of later years so that, like, they, yeah. they, were, they were still working themselves out um so today's players have all that support in place for them which is outstanding because it's you know it's, it was needed mm. um <laughs> for us yeah i think we touched on it earlier um it was like the wild west mate like yeah. Yeah, every every player sort of had to find his own way and what rugby did give us was um, the ability to network. Um, you know, and the, yeah. our young, we didn't even know what networking was. It was, it was this foreign word. I thought it was something to do with computers or something. You know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yes, we had that ability. We had the confidence, you know, to, to, to go with it. And the guys were able to sort of navigate their way around um, and some some guys do really well, but some guys, mate, some guys um, really struggled and uh, found themselves, you know, substance abuse. You know, there was drugs, there was alcohol, there was guys getting counselling, there's guys falling into deep depression, um, and guys just weren't handling life well, mm. especially yeah you know, once the, once the rugby had finished, you know. Yeah. Um, so that whole transition time, uh, you know, post rugby, I'm talking about now. Um, transitioning out of rugby life into everyday life is very tough, you know. And I'm sure you could talk to any any rugby player who's um, hung up the boots and ask them about that, and they will have a story to tell. Mm. Um, <clears throat> apart from that, um, you know, obviously the, the the game has changed from 1997 to yeah. today. Yeah. Uh, a lot faster. Um, so there's, there's still a lot of sponsors. Um, I, I think just the overall management, player management has changed and um, how how they can achieve the best out of that player, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. So and, yeah. and giving him all the support he needs to achieve that, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it seems that, well, now they definitely get hold of players a lot younger mm. than what it was like, you know, back then. Like a lot of the guys... You see that went through that area because they, I suppose they were in the amateur days and then going into professional, they all you know got careers mm. as well. Like the, yeah. I look at a lot of the Waikato team, like Matthew Cooper's the CEO of Sport Waikato and things like that. And it's hard to think now whether, like someone like me, like I couldn't, I don't think I could be. Well, I'm pretty sure I couldn't be CEO of anything except my own podcast because <laughs> you know I've got no education prior, uh, post high school yeah. and because I didn't have time to yeah. do that you know yeah. like so like I have a lot of good skills that rugby has taught me yeah but then at the end of the day if I walked in with a CV it's like okay what'd you do for this 20 years yeah. apart from play rugby it's yeah. like well I actually couldn't do anything else because I was doing everything I could to stay in the yeah. game so yeah. you're yeah, I, yeah. Cause See, that, that's one. That's, that's why I'm really happy that I started when I did. You know, yeah. um, I don't envy you of that. Yeah. Um, you know, like when we were younger, or when we were sort of first starting out in pro rugby, you know, we, we used to start, talk about doing your apprenticeship. You know, it was a common sort of term that we used. You know, done your apprenticeship. You know, and our apprenticeship was go play 
NPC, yeah. yeah. Go play well, whatever it was called back then, NPC. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's NPC called back then, yeah. ITM, whatever it is now. Yeah. Um, yeah, go, yeah, if you played NPC, how, how many years you played for Harbour, mm. you know? So you've got to do your apprenticeship, and it, not just in, in the rugby life, but in the work life as well. You know, mm. I, I left school when I was 16, I went building for a few years, you know? Yeah. Um, 6.30 training, could, yeah. you know, go do six 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 thirty trainings, go to the gym, yeah. then go to work all day. Mm. Then go to training after work, yeah. Do that four days a week, you know, and then yeah. play rugby on Saturday, and then sometimes league on Sundays, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two beers on yeah, Sunday yeah, night, yeah. So, um, yeah, it was a term that we used quite often. Was yeah, you've done your apprenticeship, you know. That, yeah. Yeah, that just sort of sprang into my mind. But, yeah, um, well, it, that was the same for me too. Like <clears> I did the exact same thing. Like I did my apprenticeship. I was play. I played for Waikato for five seasons before I played Super Rugby. Mm. But I made Super Rugby all seem to be young. But I obviously started for Waikato very young. I was still at school. Yeah. But still, I did five seasons. And, like, yeah. the group that come through that time, like, there was, you know, like, three All Blacks that were in that academy with me, like Brendan Leonard, Richard Kahui, Ella de Melmonch. Mm. We were all the same. Like, we all came out of school at the same time. We all went through the academy. We had all played at least two or three years, or at least three years for Waikato yeah. before we made Super Rugby. Yeah. And it was, like, kind of... Yeah, what you did, but you were set up really well that when you went to Super HP, right. because you're like NPC well, was the New Zealand Cup then when we did it, or well, NPC into New Zealand Cup. That level was so high, like, yeah. and I don't think it gets enough credit. Even the Mitre Ten Cup now, I don't yep. think it gets enough credit for how hard it is. Yep. Everyone and a lot of the Super coaches do it, and a lot of the Mitre Ten Cup coaches and trainers do it too. They're like, "Oh, Super Rugby is such a big jump," and I was like. Well, actually, it's not. Like, Mata 10 is... Yeah. You look at the talent across that yeah. and the level of skill in the game itself, it's quick, it's fast. Like, there might be a few more errors, but it's not a lot of difference mm. because you got to remember that when you go up to, you pull the All Blacks, come back down into that. So those guys are around you, which makes your job easier. Yep. Yeah, so it's, it's not that big a jump. But yep. if you've done that time... If you've done the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But if you and go in and do the two at the same time, then yep. you're like... Which is what's happening a lot now. Like yeah. some of the boys that are in with Waikato have been earmarked and contracted on multi-year deals from when they were sixteen. Mm. So they knew when they finished school, I'm going to Waikato. I've got mm. a full contract straight away with Minor Ten Cup, and mm. I've got a wider training group or a draft contract with the Super Rugby. And in my second year, I'm full and full, and I've got that for three years. It's like, yeah. what? Where's your yeah. apprenticeship? Yeah, yeah, yeah where's first your apprenticeship? of yeah. rugby is not yeah. apprenticeship. Yeah, me. unfortunately, when you get guys like that, guys are full of talent, yeah, no hands, you know, um, and they get put in positions like that. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's it's great, but what happens? You know, what happens when they take an injury or when they take a knock? Yeah, and that's what you know the grind of ITM does. You know, mm. you, you you get that mental toughness, and you you know how to. Um, navigate your way through the tough times you know so you can actually perform you yeah. know yeah i can shake that off i yeah. can shake that off and focus on the next task you know what's yeah. my next job here you know mm. and have that ability sometimes you've seen over the past where you've had really young guys make it super young mm. and they get thrown straight in from straight from school straight in, straight into the deep end basically and Mate, they freak out. You know, yeah. it's like buddy throwing a kitten out there. You know, <laughs> you know, they, they they just don't know how to handle the environment or all the external pressures that come with it. Yeah, you know. Yeah, well, I didn't. I was just lucky that I had an awesome support network in terms of family and friends around me, mm. and that, that that's key. A lot. Yeah. That's key. That's key. But yeah. not not everybody has that. No. You know, and it's and yeah, you can say that the, like the NZIU is doing a lot better job in the players' association about that. But it's still a very high risk environment to be like, well, you can only be with them at training, but you're not with them at home. Yeah. You know, you'd, mm. you'd, I was lucky I could go home to mum and dad's. I had that support network of mum and dad being there. When I had a shit day, I could go home. They would, they could read me like a book because mm. I'm a parents. And you sit down and they know exactly how you're feeling without you saying anything. And they start to ask the right questions to get you to talk. Because yep. I wasn't going to go home and go, oh, I had a shit day and I'm feeling this and that. Because you don't, yeah. you know. It's just not human nature. Yeah. yeah. So you think like, oh, no, I need to suck it up. Or yeah. I'm a rugby player now. I yeah. need to be tough and I need to... Oh, that's what I was about to say. Especially if you're a rugby player. Yeah. You know, you don't you don't express, you know, all your, 
heartfelt some mm. yeah yeah because you think it's seen <laughs> had, a, had a bad day yeah, yeah. yeah no it's, it was it was frowned upon and, and you know so it's good to see that people are changing their mindset now yeah, about yeah. that um with you know men's mental health and mm. you know in that regard i'm just going just jumping back to uh the match fit like uh, the response we've had since being you know showing that vulnerability on on screen there's been outstanding mate like the yeah. obviously the, the ratings were amazing um it's, it's topped everything but the response i've had in the public has been mm. outstanding I was, I was down the beach shop uh last weekend oh, yeah. and i had a, you know, a couple of big boys come up to me yeah. you know and i was like oh man these guys are you know yeah. bigger than me a lot bigger than me yeah but, Oh, awesome what you did on the uh, show, uh, Flavs, you know. Yeah. I was just like, oh, man, oh, cheers, man, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. And, and and that sparked a, a, a 20-minute conversation, you know, with a complete stranger. And it was bloody, it was good, mate. Like, the response, you know, the guys have been getting random messages, you know, on their messenger feeds and, and whatnot from complete strangers, this, 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 this um, thanking them for... Um, showing their vulnerability but you know talking about their kids you know their nine-year-olds or eight-year-olds who are trying to find their place in this world and you know and it's just great that you know it's a real uh it's been really encouraging uh to see all blacks be so open um to talk about their feelings and it's you know sparked the whole thing within their families and or you got guys who have um started training or you know decided to start eating better or you know want to be here for their grandkids and you know just yeah it was, it was just the response was outstanding yeah yeah it's awesome eh? but it's <clears throat> it's also as a society we're getting a lot better at understanding that not everything's perfect too yeah and i think and, so, and being okay with yeah it. being okay with it like yeah. i think social media for a while there was almost well because it was new no one really knew how it worked and now we've got a bit more educated on it. We understand that there's filters and different angles. You can take photos to make you look better than, you know, what you your body really is. Or, yep. you know, like these, you know, supermodels now will put photos up where they look terrible body-wise because they're just like, well, this looks like this if you take it from this angle. Yeah. And then, so it's okay. Like, it's we're not yeah. flawless. We're not perfect every time. It's yeah. good lighting. It's good cameras. Yeah. So I think, like, as people were starting to understand that, okay, not everything's perfect. Mm. It's never going to be perfect. So I need to stop chasing perfection and just worry about, yeah, you know. And just embrace what you got. Yeah, embrace you know? what you got. Yeah. Enjoy it. Yeah. You know, you want to be healthy. Um, mm. And that, that's the main thing, really. Yep. It's yep. Not, Being healthy, yeah. yeah. But you, you do a bit of F45, eh? Yeah, I'm, 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 yeah I'm a big uh, F- F45 fan, Yeah, like yourself, mate. Yeah, yeah. I've just uh, <laughs> recently, my um, brother and his wife opened one up in Moronzo, so yep. do, I'm working there sort of 25, 30 hours a week and okay. do a class every day. And yeah, great. That's good, eh? Oh, mate, I love it. I yeah. just love the, the buzz. I love the hype, the, the uh, intensity, you know. Mm. Reminds um, me of footy, eh? Like, yeah, 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 it does. It's that kind of workout, you know, and you, yeah. you go in there and um, yeah, it's 45 minutes, hammer and tongs. Music's cranked up. Um, no workouts the same. You know, mm. I, I sound like a bloody business owner. No, but... mate. Yeah, <laughs> sell it. Bro. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not a business owner, but I, no, I just, I just really love it. You know, and I, I pretty much did the same workout for about 22 years or something. I worked out one, mm. one day, and uh, I was just like, man, I'm so over this. You know, mm. and so I got into 45, and I've been doing it for the last two years. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I that's what I love about it, and it's funny because I, I'd never. I never really knew what it was about. I'd heard about it, and I knew a few people that kind of went there, but I wasn't until my brother and his wife opened it, and then I was like, oh. And then they asked if I wanted, like, I was looking for a little bit of work in that, so they were like, oh, would you be keen to be, like, a you know assistant studio manager for us because we're balancing young kids and stuff? I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll be keen as. It works with doing this podcast. allows me some time and stuff to, to do both. Yeah. So I was like, yep, yep, I'll be keen. And then we went along and did a session. We did a Hollywood session, the old one hour on a Saturday at another studio. Oh, I nearly died, eh? <laughs> I was like, I, you know, still pretty fit, like yeah. playing, you know, club footy and stuff. And, mm. um, yeah, I hadn't done anything since the season had finished, like sort of three or four weeks, been for a couple of runs or whatever. Yeah. But I was just like, but I loved it, eh? Like straight away, I was like, this is... Yeah. This is me, like, and then they start to pl- explain the system and how it works, and I was like, oh man, like, I get it, I totally yeah. get it. What yeah. people are, 
Because people love it, eh? They get addicted to it. Oh, you, you are. Mate. It's the yeah. release of endorphins, you know? Yeah. At the end of the session, you're just like, oh, man, I was absolutely yeah. there. Um, but I'm coming, back. I'm coming back tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like sugar, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, nah, definitely. And also, like, talking about, um, like, charity side of things, with match for you did Fight for Life too, eh? Yeah, 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 Mason. yeah! I, I did, mate. I was a bloody idiot. Sign up, <laughs> sign up for that one. No, I'll but you okay, mate. Um, yeah, they 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 rang me. I was actually living in France at, at the time, and um, they rang me up and said, "Oh, would you like to uh, fight for life?" And I was like, "Oh, no," because I've always sort of, I, I love the sport. I love the sport, and I've never really tried. Had you had a fight before? No, 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 right? never, never fought in my life. But I did like having the bag, you know, just as, as a form of training. Mm. Uh, and I said, like, "Yeah, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll do it. I'll do it." And oh, Flavs, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to train, you know, with the boxing training. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah sweet ass, don't worry about it. So I was building a house over there at the time, and I was like, <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, I don't need to train. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be fit, you know. Yeah, I'll be fit as a fiddle." Mate, I did no training. I, I, I was hammering tongs with this with this house I was building, so I was working long hours on the house and um, not, not enough time for training. Flew back here. He had done a three month um, training camp with Jeff Fennick. Uh, Jeff Fennick, um, who was you know one of the top Aussie trainers. <laughs> he just did this whole three month boxing camp thing. Yeah. So I got thrown in the deep end. First round, he absolutely pummeled me. I went back to my corner and I said, bro, what the hell is this? <laughs> and my mate, and my mate was my trainer as well. He just goes, bro, you're going to have to pull something out of the bag here, bro. <laughs> so I'm sick around. I was like, oh, poor technique. But I, I you know, managed to um, win that round, the second round, and then I drew in the third round. Yeah, yeah. So um, I was pretty happy I got the draw, to be Yeah, to be, hell to of an fair. effort. Like, yeah. yeah. He's a bit of a weapon too, old Willie Mason. Eh? Like pretty, mm. pretty big man. Pretty. Big. Yeah, yeah, he was a big man. I don't know what I was thinking, to be honest. Like, I was. Did you know you were fighting him when you signed up? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I did. Oh, yeah. Shit. I said, oh. <laughs> no, I, well, you know, I always sort of back my fitness, but um, yeah. man, well, my, <laughs> after about thirty seconds, honestly, my legs were jelly, absolutely yeah. jelly. Yeah. And did you think it was going to be legs, or did you think, oh no, my arms will blow? Out oh, first. I thought it would be my shoulders or something. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. yeah legs just gone. My legs, yeah, those were like rubber yeah yeah <laughs> that'd be a pretty eerie scary feeling being in the ring and having no feet under you oh you, you know you've got to like, move and... yeah well you know it's like in rugby mate you just yeah. like oh, you, you know i've got i've got the energy i've got the you yeah. know I, I can i yeah. can i can pump out 80 minutes you know yeah. like you feel strong and, and knowing that you know yeah. and knowing that your body is uh equipped for this yeah you, you know yeah. with rugby and then i went into the ring i was like holy shit yeah. <laughs> You're like, oh, yeah, come on, uh, like two-minute rounds, yeah, I'll be right. It was yeah. two-minute rounds? Three. Yeah, it was like three two-minute rounds. I was like, how, how can, oh, no, three three-minute rounds. Yeah, yeah. I was like, how, like how, minutes, how hard can that be? It's yeah, like I nine do, minutes. Yeah, yeah, Shit. I do 80 minutes. Yeah, <laughs> pump 80. <laughs> pump 80 at Pack the Park, too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you so, get a sum? No. No, no. No, neither. No. No. We were a bit, yeah, 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 we just yeah, yeah, we bloody, we were a bit undercooked our team though eh? we didn't get the rub of the green with the local boys they think they stitched us up a bit yeah yeah we're good roosters though yeah no nah. yeah. we oh. just didn't have the fit ones mate uh. off the park we we're the best we're yeah, a long yeah. shot yeah definitely <laughs> 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 yeah well what was it we got home at 3 30 didn't we yeah oh, Saturday morning yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah it wasn't the best prep and then we yeah. had a couple of tins at lunch before yeah a few tins at lunch the and then um but a few power fritters. And... Yeah. I went out to warm up and my heart rate was just through the roof. <laughs> did like a 50 metre jog and I was like, ooh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. And then I'd been playing. Yeah. Know, I'd been playing club rugby up until oh, maybe six weeks prior to that. So, yeah. Yeah, I'd hate to So think you came that. in hustling. Yeah, I'd hate to think how the other boys that hadn't been playing. I think you helped me out actually. So you're like, oh, Flash was Run out, run, run this gap outside me. I was yeah. like, okay, I'll, I'll try. Yeah, yeah. No, but you made <laughs> but, that big break when we scored from yeah, round twenty two, yeah. eh? Yeah, but yeah, you put you put me on the gap there. Yeah, yeah. and I, I couldn't keep up with you though. And she was top <laughs> I thought I was, was going to make it. Yeah, yeah. So did I. Fucking Allah, Allah yeah. started come chasing oh, me how, down. How good a Nick was he? And eh? yeah, he's in, he's in great nick. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Allah. He looks yeah. the same. Just honestly, yeah. looks the same. Move the same too. Like, Moves the same. Yeah. He's got just got the step still. Just, yeah. just a few wrinkles. Yeah, good all. balance and that. Yeah. Eh? 
but it was it was real funny because like a, obviously I'm still connected to the playing group of now, and these guys were like oh it's like Quinta Pai is a good example like centre for Waikato and the Chiefs. He was two when I debuted for Waikato, so you wow. know like, and then I was playing with him. But then so there's a lot of guys playing in this game that he'd never seen play rugby before, you know. Yeah, and yeah. I'm just like what like how. But then you forget, you know, like I, I forget like the, how yeah. big the age gap is between yeah. us. But it's like, what? He's like, oh, man, I like what I love watching it. Like those old boys still got it, you know. And I was like, bro, like once you got it, you got it. It's just yeah. you slow down, yeah, but yeah. you still got the vision, the skills. You still yeah. see things. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it was, I made. You might comment. not get there, but yeah, no, but <laughs> you, you see, can it. see it. Yeah, <laughs> but there's the little touches, you yeah. know, yeah. and that's the stuff you never lose. Like class mm. is permanent, mm. you know, forms temporary. But yeah. class is permanent. You got class, and yeah. if you look at the caliber of players that played, so yeah. you know yourself. You talked about yourself, Ali Williams, Andrew Hoare, Jimmy Cow, and Andrew Ellis. Like these are like not flash in the pan rugby players. These are like all black greats. You know, Peter Alatini, Carlos yeah. Spencer. Mm. Like these, yeah, are oh, was a great. Big, big names, yeah. Tony Brown. Like yeah. yeah, it's yeah, it was pretty. It was pretty cool for me to play. It got like because a lot of those guys I'd actually played against when I was younger, yeah. so I was actually cool to reconnect to play against them again. But old like Ogre Paul Miller, yeah, like we played my first year out of school. I played Chiefs Development. That was when he was signed up here with the Chiefs. And okay. He'd come, he'd come back and play a couple of games. And, yeah, yeah, he was always a good time. Man. Yeah, taught me some bad habits on, the, <laughs> <laughs> on and off the field. Yeah, yeah, on and off the field. But yeah, but oh, what about when he ran straight into that big fella? Oh, down that um, touch line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, right. oh, they reckon they've never seen that dude ever go backwards, eh? Yeah, but who <laughs> sat him is on there, his is ass? Right? Yeah. Oh, okay. They reckon like they saw it coming and they're like, yeah. they've never ever seen that fellow ever go backwards. Is and right? just sat him down. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I can't think of it. I've never seen Ogre go backwards either. No, nah, so. that would have been probably 300 kilos of weight hitting each other. Oh, the two of them. there's some big bodies. Yep. Mm. No, it was pretty cool. Um, I want to go off rugby a little bit now and talk about the passion for fishing. So we've got a mate in common, so Tony Carpenter. Yep. And you've done some done some trips with him at the Great Barrier Reef. But where did the passion for fishing start for you? Like, oh, I started young. I started young. I grew up out west Auckland. Um... So we'll go out to Murawai with uh, my mate's uncle. We used to go out there quite a bit. Mm. Yeah, go up, you know, go out through the breakers and hit some, hit some west west coast goodies, you know. Yeah. Um, but in between that, no, we had the creek down the road. Um, yeah, we didn't have we didn't grow up with a lot of money or anything, so we'd jump on our bikes or or, or walk and we'd go down the creek and we'd do go eeling or we'll go down to the wharf and you know just just go for bait fish yeah. really. Um, it started from there, mate, and I've, you know, I've always had a boat. I bought my first boat when I was 16, yeah. 16, yeah, because I went building. I, it was the first thing I wanted to buy was a boat. Yeah. So I bought a little uh, Fire and 12-footer. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and then I uh, kept that for years, mate. Um, yeah, and no, I've yeah. <laughs> got one good fishing story. I was out with Ron Cribb. Yeah. And my little tippy was a Samoan uh, international rugby player. Yeah. Uh, we were out fishing out, out off Omaha, and I had like a little 30 horse, which is quite big for a 12 footer. Yeah, yeah. So we were cruising along Omaha, just, and I was sort of showing off. <laughs> <laughs> I was showing off. I was just out past the breakers, you know, I was like in and out, in and out, showing off. I shouldn't even be in there. Yeah. And uh, honestly, the, the outboard came up unhitched off the back of the boat. <laughs> went, and I, and I, I was trying to hold on to the outboard, and it ripped up. And then it's like ripped out of my hand and screwed it along the top of the water. No shit. Screwed it along the top of the water by itself. The outboard just went <laughs> across the top of the water for about 20 metres. And then <laughs> and went under the water. And then we're just like, <laughs> mate, I had no, no oars, no bait, bo- no, nothing. No flares, no, no life jackets, nothing. How old were you then? Oh, mate, I would have been... 19? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 19 or something, you know. <laughs> Long hair, trying to impress the chicks. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we're stuck out there. Man, we, I know we, so we're paddling, trying to paddle into these waves with our hands and trying to get back into shore. And, oh, it was a debacle, mate. Yeah, I ended up leaving the boat. I actually left the boat on the beach. Yeah. Didn't go back and get it. I just, <laughs> I just left it. I was like, screw this. This sucks, you know. I was, I was that embarrassed. You yeah, know? you would have been at that age. Today, yeah, yeah. I was just so like, oh, this was my pride and joy too. And for me to leave it, I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> you just sort of left it because you wouldn't want anyone to see. You yeah, 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 yeah. So God, no outboard, nothing. But um, no, 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 so uh, a good mate of mine, um, Ben Allen and I, we um, we do a lot of fishing out off the knolls uh, yep. by the Hen and Chicks. Yep. Do a lot, lot up, been out up that way. Yeah, heard it. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, mate. Like at the back of the knolls, out the back of the mokes, and that yeah. we um, go for pucker and blue nose and bit bit, bit of bass if we want to go a bit wider. Uh, do a lot of snapper fishing, kingy fishing out off McGregor's and whatnot, um, up, up around Mangawai. Still go out the west coast quite a bit. Went out there a few weeks ago and um, yeah, you messaged me, eh? Before you yeah, we got some good fish, mate. All between sort of twelve and eighteen was the biggest on that yeah. day. But um, twelve and eighteen pound, you know, big just, fish, eh? Yeah, just monsters, mate. Yeah. You know, came back and gave them all out to family and friends, yeah. which is cool, which I like doing. Yeah, that's what I love about fishing. Yeah. Eh, is like oh, I keep nothing. I, I never keep fish. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like I enjoy eating it, but I keep enough for probably two feeds, maybe yeah, yeah, with same. the family. Yeah, because. You know, I can't eat the same thing over and over, and I only like eating fish when it's fresh. Yeah, so I normally have dinner that night, and we'll have it the next Honestly, day. Honestly, I'm lunch the fussiest Mary you'll ever meet yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to fish. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. And then I just, yeah, I just love sharing it out. Like yeah. Whenever I go for a fish and come back here and yeah. fill it up, I'll send the text out down the road, and yeah. whoever wants it, I drive down, and drop it off, and yeah. Then, uh, I love how grateful people are for it. Too oh, because mate. Not everyone has the means, you know, to get out there and, yep. and, and catch fish. Yeah, you know, as we know, what's, yeah. what's fresh snapper these days? $45, 48 dollars a kilo or yeah. something. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Here, here you go. Here yeah. you go. Here's, yeah. here's, a, here's, a, here's a big bundle kilos. of fillets. Yeah, yeah. yeah here's yeah. a big bundle of fillets. Yeah. <laughs> go for gold, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, no, I just love fishing and, and back to TC. Yeah, like we've had um, went from my mate's fortieth, um, went over there and. Oh, the the fishing on the Great Barrier Reef is bloody next level, man. Yeah. Just, did you just did you know Tony before you went over? No, that's the no. first time I met him was on Hellraiser over yeah. in Kens. Um, went out, we would have had, mate, we would have had probably twelve to sixteen marlin. Yeah, you know, over, over three days. Yeah, and then uh, what a trip. Yeah, yeah, it was <laughs> outstanding, mate. And yeah. then um, you know, it wasn't a matter of you know what. If, whether, whether we'll catch one or not yeah. it was how big is it going to be you know Yeah. and then I went back the following year for my 40th Yeah. so me and three other my closest mates uh, we went over there and um, I managed to get a 650 kilo uh, black yeah. horn um, which Tony Carpenter uh, led for me about three or four times and then <laughs> good, we'll get it close to the boat we'll jump on the lead um, we'll pull it right in then it'll go again did that about three or four times, and then it went. Honestly, it went about thirty meters off the back of the boat. No, no, that probably twenty meters. And as I was fighting this fish, you know, for the hour, hour and a half, or whatever it was, there was ocean sharks just hovering under the boat. So, oh yeah, yeah, onto it, mate. Like yeah. Actually, we don't need to go chasing. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the fish this is going to come. Gonna yeah, come the to fish the is going to come to us. Yeah. So they, they actually stayed there, and and then well, after about third or fourth third or fourth time with this fish being led. Um, they would have figured out it was tired. Eh? Yeah, it was tired. Yeah. And they came in, honestly, mate, and they whacked, whacked this fish to the point where it was totally out of the water. And yeah. the sharks were coming out sort of waist, waist height. You know, yeah. six, it was about, probably about six or seven of these ocean sharks come yeah. out sort of waist height. Just go whack, 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 whack. Yeah. And this marlin was sort of, you know, sort of juggling yeah. on, to, on top of these ocean sharks and just, out the back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, nature's cruel way. Eh? Oh mate, oh, wait. get the head in. <laughs> <laughs> so we managed to get the head in, and uh, yeah, obviously uh, measure the diameter, measure the girth, and yeah, um, yeah, the, the the skipper um, he he put it at six fifty based it's on a, the measurement based on the measurements. It's yeah. a big fish. Yeah, so now it's um <laughs> like its bill would be like a baseball bat. Oh, it's, oh, it's huge, man! I put yeah. a few rugby socks over the top of it yeah. and yeah. <laughs> put it back through yeah. customs and. <laughs> Yeah, to, to my surprise, they're like, "Yeah, come on, come on through, Mister Flower." I was like, "Oh, sweet." <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, so it's um, now it's um, hanging in Fruno uh, main office. Oh, wicked! On the North Shore, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is yeah. that on the North Shore? Is it? Yeah, just and, in uh, Wairau. Yeah, and a good yeah. friend of yours is. Yeah, is Gareth Hodson is the um, GM there. Yep. Yeah, and um, yeah, obviously Fruno you know, speaks for itself. You know, yeah, yeah. They do some amazing pretty, stuff yeah, and pretty um, big brand. Yeah, everyone's everyone's using the gear and yeah. You know, TC included yeah. and a few other close mates who run charters that they all use it and swear yeah. by it. So. Yeah, well, Tony loves it, eh? Yeah. Like, yeah he, um, 
yeah, he's um, he swears by it and he really enjoys it. Mm. Yeah, be a pretty cool brand to to work with, I'd imagine. Yeah, 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 it is. The GM must be a good bastard of his jaw, mate. Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> resilient, resilient. <laughs> Yeah, no, he's, he, no, he's a good, good bastard, and uh, you know, obviously with all our fishing trips, we're uh, Team Furuno, yep. you know, and um, there's a good group of us uh, core guys who, um, you know, each time he's got a new sounder out or whatever, we uh, pick it up and, you know, give him our opinions and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. whatnot, you know, assessors, yeah. official assessors, yeah. um, but you know, more importantly, mate, it's just about mates getting, getting together and yeah. having a good time, as you know, mm. fishing allows that, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I love fishing, eh, for that, like, just being able to yeah. go out. I really, like, enjoy going out on the West Coast here because yeah. you lose cell phone reception at about, you know, in the summer when we go out marlin fishing, you lose cell phone reception about the 50 metre mark. Yeah, yeah. And then it's just, you know, it's just dead, you know, silent. You're there with mm. your mates and you spin some shit and you're not chasing emails and different things that, you know, when work's trying to pull you back. You were just out there and you don't like fielding, fielding calls from your from your wife. Or? No, no, I enjoy it. Like, and uh, <laughs> funny you say that because I, I spoke to her about this, and <laughs> because I find that that having that time and that break, or you know, not the break, but having been like a forced disconnection, yeah. that I'm that much more excited to come home. Yep. At the end of the day, 100%, you know, like yeah. having that forced gap of like we can't, I can't actually talk to her. I can't. You know, talk to my boys yep. so that when I come home, I'm like, yes, like, you know, I'm, yep. a, I'm actually excited to come home, yep. share what I've been doing. Same if I go for a hunt and you lose reception for a couple of days yep. and then you come back, it's it's so much more, I don't know, like, it, it's, yeah, I don't really know the right word to explain, but I'm just excited, like, really, really excited yep. to get back home and have that connection again. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Totally get it. You get it, eh? Yeah. 100%. You'd get it, eh? Because you're an outdoorsman like yeah like yeah yeah i totally get it like and, and it's just uh having that time to yourself mate you know you can reflect and um and, and focus on what you enjoy doing mm. you know and just really lap that up you know yeah. <laughs> make, yeah. make the most of that you know whatever you know whether it's whether it's hunting or fishing or yeah. you know or f45 or f45 <laughs> 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 you know mm. but it's uh nah i know exactly what you're saying mm. Um, I want to jump into back into rugby yep. and talk about your time with the New Zealand Maldives. So, because I like for me, like your Maldi heritage, we're talking, you know, prior to coming on, like your Tainu and Napui, same as me. But I grew up disconnected, I suppose, from my Maldi culture. So I didn't. My mum, you know, she doesn't. She didn't speak today, or she does. She basically, she's got a, a Maldi father and a Pakia mum. And she grew up very white, well, we call it plastic, you know, like she's got the color, but she's not actually moldy. Mm. Um, but it was just the way that she was brought up. And I was, I sort of followed suit, but it wasn't until I made the moldies and started to learn about my heritage and, and where I sort of came from. And then you start to get that connection with your teammates. Because for me, that team, there's nothing like it. You're actually connected by blood, yeah. which... You know, the All Blacks, you're connected to the country because you choose to live there. Yeah. But to actually say you have the same blood as your teammates yeah. is like a pretty powerful thing. How did you find that environment? Oh, man, those are some of my, my best years, to be to be fair, you know. Um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed the All Blacks as well. But for, for me, the Māori All Blacks took the cake, you know. Yep. Um, and, and you're right, you feel that bond mm-hmm. instantly. You know, you're in there... Uh, the wire tiles together. I, I grew up very similar to you, mate. Yeah. Like, um, you know, we use the term plastic, but uh, yeah, yeah. you know, I grew up in Auckland. Yeah. <laughs> Auckland with my with my parents, my mum's Pakia, and my dad's Maori. Um, and I was always a little bit jealous or envy of my cousins because my dad was the youngest of four brothers, and his all his brothers spoke Maori. No, they, oh. they, they learnt Maori, yeah. and so all his kids learnt Maori. You know, so we'll go to the Marae and, you know, I'll be the Aucklander coming, <laughs> turning yeah. up with the Marae, you know, and um, I can never speak Māori. You know, so they knew all the customs, you know, procedure, protocol. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, so I always felt a little bit jealous of that. But yeah. um, so when Dad went, because Dad, went, Dad was the youngest, he, when he went to school, that's when they started, oh, yeah. started strapping guys, you know. Yeah. No speaking Māori at school. Um, 
yeah but yeah I, I've you know in my later years I've been trying to reconnect with that as well mm. um, but uh, yeah for me Māori All Blacks was outstanding man. we had Matt Poe, Jim Love um, were our coaches yeah. um, and just the, the whole environment was good mate it was a real um, play hard <laughs> But yeah. I know it sounds bad, but play hard, party hard, yeah, yeah. type mentality, you know. Yeah, and we, yeah we'll, we'll do the work. We're, we're such a um, big pool of talent, mate. Like the the depth within our team was ridiculous. You know, we had like the Norm Berrymans and Carlos and Adrian Cashmore and guys who were, you know went on to obviously bigger things. With you know, not bigger things, but um, great things with the All Blacks as well. You know. Mm. Just really top players, and they, um, yeah, but they're like, man, I'm just on a messenger feed now with uh, the All Blacks, in, uh, the Māori All Blacks in '98. Yeah, and uh, we went, we toured Scotland, and uh, mate, we, we said, Oh, we should get together. And honestly, within two hours, we had that whole team, yeah, on board, yeah, and we we're arranging a get together in February next year so oh wicked yeah yeah but just just mate and it's it sits in everyone's memory bank you know mm. very fondly so you talked about it there but like play hard party hard for me like you have to have balance in life to be yeah. successful and i think that's why the the maldives works like because it is a short campaign like, i don't think you could party as hard as the maldives do and play as hard for a sustained period of like a whole super rugby campaign yeah but to go and do it for a month or three weeks or two games or a game yeah easily you yeah. can pull that off yeah you yeah. know but i just find because I, I did it through my career there'd be long periods where i would be really strict on my diet wouldn't drink and the rest of it and i'd get super super fit and then all of a sudden then i would and you'd, you'd hit kind of a sweet spot start playing well and then you'd overdo it and then you get flat and then you'd and then you go and blow out on the piss so you're going on this massive wave big you spikes, know yeah. big spikes of form yeah but it wasn't until i realized like well Every time I do this, it works to a point, and then I go too far, and yeah. then I drop away, yeah. and then I go and drink piss again, or, you know, relax a bit more, stop training as hard, focus more on my life outside of rugby, and then I find the sweet spot again, but then I do that for too long, and I get out of shape, or lose a little bit of focus, and then it goes shit, yeah. and then I was like, well, there's got to be a better way, so once I started to flatten the curve, and be more balanced of how I spent my time outside of rugby mixed with you know having beers with my teammates or my mates outside of rugby and then training once i balanced that out then i became a lot more yeah. consistent yeah yeah see well a lot of people don't have that awareness mate like that uh, what, what, you, what you just mentioned there yeah uh, a lot of you know that, that, that's usually where you see players sort of drop off you know mm. and fall away and, and you know not continue to play at a certain level of rugby um you know because they don't have their awareness like what you just described there yeah um a lot of people get get on the down and they carry on going down you know uh, um and never sort of work, work it out never take the blinkers off and you know sort of assess where they are and what changes might be needed etc so for me that's the only reason i stayed in the game so long mm. i reckon is because i got there people always ask them, oh man you must be like super strict on your diet and like train hard out and the rest of it and i'm sitting there thinking i'm like well actually i don't do either of those perfectly like i do them at times but i don't do it that well and i'm like am i just super lucky or am i actually super smart like i yeah, don't know yeah, you know like yeah, i kind of thought it was yeah. luck for years i'm like shit i'm dodging a bullet here like <laughs> you know sort of surviving but then yeah. now i you know you get further down the track and look back and i look at other people's careers and the way they went guys i played with and i'm like shit he just overdid it burnt out lost the love of it and you know, like I still now, like it's pissed down with rain here on a Tuesday night. I'm still excited to get in my car and drive 40 minutes to go to club training. Yeah. Like at 36, like that's yeah, a bit, yeah. you know. Yeah. So there's some, there's got to be something to that. Like I must have either done something right or I just have this fire in me that just won't go out, if that makes sense. Like, yeah, well, well, yeah. Most guys who have played for as long as you have will have the fire, Yeah. you know. And you can you're competitive, mate, by nature, mm. you know, and you and you don't want to, um, yeah, you, know, you got that drive, you know. If you if you have, still have the ability to play, then play, mm. you know. Yeah, well, everyone keeps saying, "Oh, you're a long time retired." Yeah, yeah. That's all, man. That's all. I always put my hands up for those all those charity games and all that. Mm. I, I love having a crack, you know. Yeah. 
yeah or, or or challenge myself in another way you know i did oxfam last year you know which i really enjoyed that was a hundred kilometer walk yeah you know so just putting yourself out there you know i like surfing but you know sometimes i throw myself on some real big surf too too big i, should, yeah. I shouldn't actually be out there <laughs> i shouldn't be out there by any stretch of the imagination you know guys yeah. out there you know way more experienced than what i have but um that's what life's about man mm. Mm. yeah pushing yeah. it yeah well because it's funny you sort of mentioned that there in the oxfam thing because uh I've always said that I want to run a marathon. Like, I I don't give a shit how fast I do it. Like, I just want to do it, so I've done it. Like, a bucket yeah. list kind of thing. And a, a mate of mine, Jack Devan, um, from Morons, or oh, he's not a, he's not a, well, he is a mate, but he's um, just a young fellow in Morons, and he put a post on Instagram a couple of weeks ago, and was like, oh, I want to do this, um, now that I'm talking about this, so I'm going to have to do it. But <laughs> he put this post up and he wanted to create a, like he, he put the post, he said, I want to create a movement where I can get 100 people together. We run a marathon. Each of us raise $1,000 and we donate it to mental health in New Zealand. So he just put this post up and I just replied. I saw it and I was like, I've always said I wanted to do one or I was going to do one. So I was like, well, if I don't say yes now, I'll end up putting it off and I'll get to a point where I, end up stop playing rugby or I lose a lot of fitness and then I'm going to have to train super, super hard to get to a point to be able to just complete it. So I was like, fuck it, you know, I'm going to do it. So I just said, yeah, bro, I'm in. And then he's like, oh, sweet. And then I started talking about it at, at the gym um, with different people in the community and all of a sudden, like, everyone's like, oh, man, like, yep, we'd be keen as to get in behind this. And yeah. I sort of said to him, I was like, oh, how, how are we going to do this? Like, are we just going to, are we going to run it here in Morrinsville? Because everyone was asking, like, all the local businesses in Morrinsville, started talking they're like oh we're we gonna run it here are you gonna run it here in Morrinsville and I was like oh I don't know so I asked Jack and he was like oh I thought Morrinsville doesn't have a marathon they only have a half and I was like bro we'll just run our own like if 10 people turn up and do it 10 if it's just me and you then we'll just do it like yeah, yeah. it doesn't matter we'll just sort of map it out but yeah. then it's kind of growing and like I, I don't I hope it becomes a really big thing because it'll be yeah. awesome for the town awesome for the awareness yeah and it'll be really really I mean, cool. I've, I've been, uh, it's on my bucket list still. Yeah. Yeah, I've done, I've done two halves. Yep. Two halves. But um, I like to make it a whole. <laughs> mm. I'll sign up, Come mate. Yeah, we'll sign up. I'll sign up. Sign me up. Nice. I'm in. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it'll, um, yeah, I think we sort of started talking and, and and messaging kind of back and forward. And I said to him, I was like, bro, I think this could get a lot bigger than what we think it's going to be because it's for a good cause and a good reason. Yeah. And you know at the end of the day like people just need to be made aware of things and they'll they'll donate they'll give their time yeah and i like you know if we raise a dollar we raise a dollar but if it's we're just talking about it and making an awareness of it yeah. like that that for me is a positive thing yeah. it's not about the money and how much money we raise yeah like the more money obviously the better yeah but at the end of the day if we you know like i said if we raise a dollar at least it's a dollar for a good reason yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I'm not sure about the uh, how many hills you got in Morrinsville. Yeah, no, nah, it's pretty flat. Is it? Is it yeah, pretty yeah. flat? Okay, I yeah. oh, good. I was going to suggest we could go over the mountain and just run the beachfront or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> something nice, nice and, flat, and flat. Yeah, 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 dead flat. You know, <laughs> dead flat. Nah, it's pretty flat in Morrinsville. Okay, oh, that's good. Good to hear. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Now we're committed to it now. So. Oh, yeah, okay. Yep. Yeah. Sign once me this, up. Once this goes public, where people hopefully more people start talking and. Yeah, if you're keen to get involved, send a message to um, to my Instagram page, and then yeah, we'll sign you up, get involved. Come join us. Come join us. Yep. Yeah. Or if you're a business and you want to donate, or person and you want to donate, then yeah, we'll, we'll work it all out. Details will come out, no doubt. Costumes. Costumes for Sweeney. <laughs> oh, <hell no. laughs> Hashtag customs costumes. <laughs> um. I do want to talk about your move offshore too. So, like, you went, you played in both Japan and France. Yep. What was your reasoning for going offshore to Japan? And did you have any regrets for the timing of it, like, when you decided to go? Uh, yeah. So, my first time around, I missed selection for the All Blacks. And um, the opportunity arose for me to um, play in, in Nagoya for Toyota. Um, so I went over there for two years. Um, while I was over there, they, um, Graham, Ted got a hold of me and asked me to come back. Um, so I came back and played for the All Blacks 2006 and six and seven. Then I missed 
played the Tri Nations uh, leading into the World Cup, and then um, I got the chop. So I um, signed with Mitsubishi over in Japan again. Yeah. Cheers for the good, George, mate. <laughs> um, yes. So Simon went over to Japan again, came back, and I was going to retire at that stage, actually, but I was. Were you? Yeah, I was only sort of 30. Yeah. Thirty that, was old back then, though. Yeah, hey. yeah, sort of was. Like thirty was the sort of age where you start thinking about retirement. Obviously, that's shifted to sort of thirty-five these days. But you know, um, at the time, I sort of had enough of rugby and just getting a little bit frustrated with rugby. And you know, going to training, I wasn't really feeling. I sort of lost that spark and didn't really have a hunger for it. I came back to New Zealand for about six months uh, with the family and. Um, I was approached to, you know, I was thinking, you know, I was trying to find a new career, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I got a, approached by a couple of clubs in France. So I um, had the choice of going to Paris or playing for Bayonne in the South of France. And um, I was very happy that I signed with Bayonne. Yeah. Um, not so much for the rugby, but the the lifestyle. And in the, in the South of France, I, was, I live right on the beach. <laughs> yeah. Live right on the beach down there. I'd surf on my back doorstep, and you know, um, yeah, real, had a, had an amazing time. Yeah. Yeah. How did you find the difference in the cultures from like France to Japan, or to here as well? Like, oh, a lot mate, of similarities and no, different three ways? completely different yeah. countries. Yeah, yeah, com- yeah. <laughs> it's different. <laughs> I don't know the word to express describe it they're so different you know yeah. they're so different like you got New Zealand you know, we're a very humble type um, nation and then we've got Japan and the people are beautiful as you know um, the food's amazing but the lifestyle you know I, I didn't really had sort of adapt to the um, the concrete jungle you know I was yeah. living in Tokyo the last time around and, and, and Nagoya for that matter it was just a very very much a concrete jungle you know I'm Born and bred in New Zealand, you know, I love the ocean, love the hills and mountains and the green. I love green, you know. Mm. Um, uh, and you don't get that in Japan, not really, unless you go in there, sort of, yeah, you know, outside of the main cities. Yeah. Um, well, like Japan too, like I found Japanese society really difficult in terms of how they don't fight for things, if that makes sense. Like you would have noticed that. With uh, like I I didn't re- I couldn't work it out to start with when I was playing, like these Japanese boys that I was playing with would be like awesome one week, and then the next week they would just like not even try, and I'm just like what? Mm. And it took ages to, for me, you know, a couple of seasons to get to know them a little bit better and get to know the language better and understand the culture. And it was because they were playing their like senpais, their elders yeah. Yeah. from their high school or from their university, so they were purposely. Yeah not show them up and yeah. I was just I, I it blew my mind but yeah. it, you, when you see the way society is wired over there yeah. like you get a job and that's your job till you retire and the older you get the more you get paid it doesn't matter what role you have you're always a natural progression and the older you get the more money you make so they don't learn to fight for things it's like they get a foot in the door They I guess they probably fight for the foot in the door but once it's in there they're like oh Mm. I'm here, mm. like, mm. and now I'm set for the rest of my life. Yeah. As long as I don't commit a major felony, then I'm sorted. I'm not sure if you know this, but it's, Japan's got one of the biggest suicide rates mm. in the world. Yeah, uh, for that, that for that for that very point. Yeah, the very fact that you just brought up, like, when they get a job, if they lose that job, oh, mm. you know, the world is just ended for them. Mm. You know, and they'll never get reemployed uh, from another employer. Mm. Yeah, yeah, like they're. No one would touch them. Yeah. Yeah, because there's a reason why you've just been fired. Yeah. And that's, you know, despite what the reason might be, yeah. you know, you're just very frowned upon. And it's real senpai yeah. type mentality. Well, um, you see it too, eh? Like, even with the foreigners um, playing over there, there's no player movement, like, between teams like you see here. Like, mm. you apply, you'll sign and go to a team, but you're not getting much game time. So you're like, all right, like, I, I want to push to play more. I want to go somewhere else. Yeah. It's like, no, you play for... Um, yep. Kudin or Sanix very submissive or Mitsubishi yep. like no, nah, you can't come here yep. like what <laughs> very submissive um, extremely introverted um, society isn't it yeah you know no, nobody likes to put their hand up or, or stand out or mm. um, 
but but that works, you know, that, that yeah. works for them. That, that's just that's just them, you know. And um, things like lining up, very patient people, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, you go somewhere in the weekend, like, there's a line like 300 meters long, and I don't know about you, but man, I'm like, I get itchy toes. Yeah. You know, I'm like looking around. I'm yeah. sp- can I, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. how do I get to the front? You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, yeah, I really struggle with that. But um, I just I find too like how do they like to me? It seems like lateness isn't a thing over there because they're never in a rush. Mm. So it's like is being late like is traffic just a legitimate excuse that oh, if there was traffic like all good like it doesn't yeah. matter that you're late to work because yeah. you see it like the traffic's like. You know, it can be horrendous at times, but there's no road rage, no impatientness. Like no. they just sit in it. Yeah, they get to work when they get to work, and then yep. they work like it's. But in New Zealand, if you were late because of traffic, like you'll lose your job. Yeah, they'll be like, "Where were you?" And, like, yeah. and I was like, "Mate, traffic was jammed." Like I was, well, not my fault. Like, <laughs> you know, so people rage out because they're yeah. like, "Fuck, I'm going to lose my job yeah, if I don't get yeah, to work." Yeah. Well, yeah, they're not volatile, are they? <laughs> nah. You know, and there's no big peaks or spikes or. You know, and, the, and their mannerism yeah. throughout the day. You know, yeah. they just they just sort of flatline it. Yeah, the whole way. You know, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Until they well, get, this is bullshit. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> until they get on the piss, and then they just yeah. lose the handle. Right? Yeah, lose the handle big time. Yeah, I uh, thought we, we like had a bad binge drinking culture in New Zealand, but over there, man, oh, it's like if they drink, it's like balls to the wall. Yeah, like, I'm businessman. Businessman. Yeah, mm. they just send it out. Eh? Mm. Yeah, they yeah, send they it and then they're done in an hour and a half. Yeah, they do. <laughs> they do, mate. And yeah. but um, what we found is they were very uh, welcoming. Like we went to this real sort of like a new neighbourhood, new subdivision uh, in the middle of Tokyo. You know, um, and they'd come to my gate. They'll never enter the front gate, mm. and like I'll be, you know, the doors will be all be always be closed. You don't actually ever go to somebody's house. You always meet them at the gate. You know, you say hello at the gate. Say goodbye at the gate. How was yeah. your day at the gate? You know. Yeah. Um, so I always had my gate open, yeah. and they used to freak out at that. <laughs> Gates open, you know. And I'd have the front door open, yeah. I'd a bit of music on or whatever. You know, I walk around, you know, just in board shorts and yeah. bare feet and all that. You know, <laughs> come in, come in, you can come in. Oh, you know, yeah, they yeah. sort of freak out. But come in, it's okay. You know, yeah. came out the back and you know, put something on the barbecue or whatever. And they, yeah. man, that is. When we left, when we left there, like honestly, it was like a scene out of the movies. We had uh, the whole street was there. It probably would have been like easily, oh man, I'd like to say 50, 50 people there. Yeah. And we were driving off, and the whole street, the whole community was running down the road crying and yeah. waving goodbye. And yeah. mate, it was, it was just so overwhelming, you know, like, yeah, you know, we've had that much effect on, on this mm. neighborhood, this community within. You know, two years of being there. Yeah, it was the same yeah, for no. me at Senex. When I left Senex, all the boys came around because it kind of, yeah, like it was, a, all, it was a bit of a surprise like when it all kind of happened and it happened real quick. Yeah. So I was sort of like, whoa, and then all the boys turned up at home and the translator, like the, well, a couple of the boys went to high school in New Zealand that played and so they were like translating for the boys because, you know, like my Japanese wasn't good enough yeah. for them to get their message really clearly across and yeah. like, poor translator but he's crying the whole time because <laughs> what these guys are saying is so emotional so it's yeah. making him cry which yeah. then makes me cry and yeah, yeah, yeah. i was just yeah. like i just like i felt for them yeah. like having to translate yeah, it all, you yeah, know because yeah. those guys come in and like it was oh. like a tonguey like yeah, yeah, yeah. it was yeah. crazy yeah like, yep. yeah had exactly the same you know uh, experience yeah mm. but if you share so much of like you're very good at it and i spoke about this on a, a couple other podcasts that i've done recently about you as a person, because I mentioned that you would be um, coming on the podcast, yep. is like you're very giving of yourself and your time. And you, like I really noticed that when I spent the time with you down at Pack the Park, like you're charismatic, you're comfortable to talk to anybody, you're, yeah, you're just open and forward and you're engaging conversation and you're like there in that moment with them. And that's quite a powerful thing. Mm. Like not many people can do that. Mm. And the people that do do it, they do it really well, like yourself. So no doubt all those people, even though there was a language barrier there, still they felt that because they can read body language, you know, yeah, and yeah. they felt comfortable around you. And with these guys, I was, you know, the same because of training and playing with them for three years. And yeah, yeah it's a pretty, uh, yeah, pretty emotional thing to let go. 
Yeah, yeah, man, and I'm, I've, you know, I've still uh, got that relationship with um, a whole bunch of them. Yeah, you know, well, they, they send me stuff in Japanese. I don't even know, understand what they're saying, bro. Yeah. But <laughs> but yeah. just the form that you know, just that we're having that contact. You know, yeah. their communication is still there. Um, it's good, you know. I, I put stuff in translator and <laughs> yeah. put some smart ass re- remark back, but yeah, you know, the, the, the communication is still there, which is yeah. which is good. Yeah, no, that's cool. Yeah, cool. Just had to um, duck off to the toilet, but we're back. We're back. Um, yeah, so France, how was that different in terms of? The uh, I really threw myself into the culture because uh, when I was eighteen, I went over to France. Oh yeah, yeah, played a season over there when I was young. Yeah, um, yeah, man, I bloody. I was 18, I was playing club rugby here. This, honestly, this French guy with the moustache and the goatee and the beret. Hey, Mr. Flavou, you want to come to uh, France? We'll come play in France. And I was like, oh, yeah, bro. Yeah. <laughs> I hadn't been on a plane, nothing, you know. So I was like, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll come to France. Didn't even ask my parents, nothing, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yep, I'll go to France. <laughs> Straight away, just said, yep, yep. So anyway, you know, quite like two. Sorry, honestly, just just on that. Sorry, there's heaps of power in saying yes to things, eh? Yeah. Like I've kind of worked this. I was talking to a mate recently, and um, yeah, we we're talking about it, and just having the ability to just say yes, say yes, just say yep, yes, yep. and then you yep. never know where it's going to lead yep. or what's going to happen from yep. it. But yeah, unfortunately, I've said that all my life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's got me in trouble, but yeah, uh, yeah. you know, but but you learn from that too, though. Yeah, don't you? Like, yeah. Have you never? If you never make a mistake, you never grow. No, that's It's just right. like the All Blacks, you that's know, right. they, they lost to Argentina, but look what they turned around and did yep. two weeks later. Like, yep. If you win all the time, you never lose any. Oh, you never learn anything. Mm. As soon as you lose, you learn a lot, mm. you know. Mm. Yeah, same with making mistakes. In 100%. Life, uh, yeah, yeah, so yeah. I went over there when I was quite young. You know, I, I went to, arrived in a um, very remote um, village in the south of France, Nobody spoke English. I mean, nobody. I didn't even have a translator. Nothing. Nobody. You were what? Eighteen. I was eighteen. <laughs> so, so I rocked up in this but I was honestly no, nobody could speak English to me. Yeah. So, I did French lessons yeah. and learned all the grammar and um, obviously learned how to speak French. And then I um, actually went to the school and I started teaching them English. Oh yeah. Yeah, when I was 18, you know, I had, I had a girlfriend in my class. <laughs> <laughs> so I was 18, all these girls were 17. Yeah. Yeah, so my girlfriend was in the class, so I was teaching them, you know, basic English. And then, ironically, the, um, that's when Once the Warriors came out. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I asked the principal, and I said, oh, can I take my class to um, the movie, yeah. movie theatre, to watch this New Zealand film? Yeah. You know, because I've been teaching them the hucker and yeah. stuff like that. Took my whole class to the the film and because I had a few tattoos um, they, they, they started looking at me differently oh, yeah. <laughs> after, after watching the movie like honestly it scared the shit out of them yeah. scared the shit out of them they looked at me they kept looking back at me like you know, so I could see them feel them looking at my tattoos and yeah. stuff like that <laughs> they were like oh you know he's dangerous he's dangerous he's dangerous, he's dangerous. Yeah. you know and um, yeah so when I went back to France you know my later years um I instantly had that um, connection with with them, and I went back to my host family where I lived when I was eighteen. Oh, went wicked. back and saw them, spent two Christmases with them, yeah. and shit, they would have loved seeing you. Again. Yeah, so yeah. did all that, and obviously, you know, I could speak better French now, and um, I could speak them, but you know, yeah. obviously, improved over the, the the five years I was in France as well. You yeah. know, so um, yeah, yeah, so like um, my parents my my french parents yeah um they're, they're um, godparents to my kids and stuff oh, like that yeah. yeah yeah so we've got all that connection there and um I, I just really threw myself into the culture there and um the particular village where i was living in bida um which is just next bay south of barrett um they were quite a big sort of ex- ex- expat community there a lot of a lot of old kiwis there, oh, there okay. like michael clamp who used to play for yep. all blacks yeah, and yeah. jeff Bradburn who was ex wellington and Alan Duff, the oh, yeah. author, was there. Yeah. Um, so there's quite a good little community there. Um, so we used to get together quite often, especially for you know, you know Christmas and New Year's and that kind of stuff. And um, 
we, you know, we just had a really good time. Our kids were obviously educated in France. and They speak French? Yeah, they're yeah. all French speaking. Um, so when we returned to New Zealand after five years, we uh, kept the French thing going. Yep. Um, so, so they just did lessons and stuff? Or? No, we actually went to a oh, French yeah. bilingual school. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it was a bilingual school in Auckland where our kids were doing three days in French and two days in English. Yeah. Yeah, so we kept that going for three, four years. Yep. Um, They'll never yeah. lose that now, will they? Well, we hope but, not. We hope yeah. not. Yeah, I think it's yeah. it's sort of embedded in them now, you yeah. know. Um, they would say true... Um, Bing, bing, bilingualism mm. is um, it's it's when you can start when you start dreaming in a diff, different language. You know? Oh, okay. It's, yeah. Am do I, you do that? Like, no, no, uh, I don't. Because no, yeah. in my head, I always translate. You know, yeah. you know if I want to say something in French, I, I translate English oh, yeah. in my head. You in know? your head, and yeah. then spit and then, it out. Then I yep. spit it out in French. And that, yep. That's the way my brain works. But yep. for my oldest daughter, India, like she she thinks in French. Yeah. And speaks in French. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know. Yeah, and she dreams in French yeah. as well. So it's um, yeah, she's definitely got it. And my youngest one, I'm, like she's done six six years of schooling in yeah. in French, you know. So yeah. it's there. Yeah, you know, she's too shy to speak it around, yeah. you know, Kiwis, Kiwis. But um, yeah, I'm sure it's there if she wants it. Yeah, yeah, oh, that's cool, eh? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and we we touched on it a little bit earlier, but like exiting pro rugby because. It's very, like you mentioned, it's very different in terms of the network that is around players now from the Wild West that we called it when you guys started. Mm. Like how, and you've, you, you know, you mentioned you've seen lots of people struggle with it and stuff as well. How, how did you find it coming out? Because you would have finished your playing, like professional playing career in France? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. you didn't come back here and play professionally at all in New Zealand? No. 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 So I finished professionally over there. Um, I ended up playing... Uh, Did you do La Marche? Did you... Uh, the Marche? Yeah, yeah. Nah, yeah. No, I actually tried tried to for a few, few months and then... Yeah clicked onto me and told me no <laughs> um, but I did finish playing club, club rugby over there I finished yep. with a season of club rugby oh, okay. for a um, yep. local club which was just across the road from where I was living yep. in France and um, yeah took them to championship after 25 years and we won it oh wicked yeah so it was pretty um, yeah big moment for um, yep. for Bida and um, yeah but that transition like I, I went back to building um, I actually built a, um, I renovated it for Turned into rebuild um, an old uh, three hundred year old um, Basque villa right on the beach on the coast of um, Bida. So I went back onto the tools because that's sort of what I knew. Mm. I've sort of stayed in property you know throughout my career. Um, so went back on the tools, did a big renovation there, and uh, didn't really think about it at the time. I thought you know I got this transition thing sussed mm. you know um yeah you know I, I know building i know how to build i'll just get back to building um and that was my sort of mentality but what i didn't realize was i wasn't handling it that well because i sort of wasn't having those discussions with the people close to me and um probably could have handled that whole thing a lot better because you yeah, know it was uh, and it is it's a big transition yeah, yeah. you know huge it's hu- huge and yeah for us we as players, we sort of tend to focus on ourselves mm. a little bit too much, you know. Like it's okay. Oh, what, what am I doing now? Okay, mm. who am I now? Who, who, it's all me, 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 mm. you know. But it, you actually have a massive impact on the ones close to you. Yeah, you know. Well, because in professional sport, you have to be me, me, me because yeah, that's the only way you get ahead. That, like you've got to focus that's on right. yourself that's first right. to yeah. be successful. Yeah, and that, and that was my mentality right through my whole career. It's like, man, I'm in full control. Yeah, you know. I can be fitter, you know. If I want to be fit, yeah. I'll run out there. I'll go out there and run. Yeah. You know, I'll be fit. I'll be super fit. I want to be strong. I'll go to the gym. Mm. You know, and and it's very me, me. You know, and, yeah. And you and you find your slot within the team, but it's very you very you manage yourself, right? Mm. Um. And sometimes that takes you away from focusing on the people who are also yeah. involved. You know, yeah. like 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 your wife and and your children. Um. Yeah. So. When I look back now, I, you know, at the time I thought, okay, yeah, I'm actually managing this quite well. But now I look back, yeah, that was, that actually had an effect on my, my my partner and my kids. You know, because I threw myself back in the building, so I'd I'd, I'd leave leave when it was dark, start yeah. start building, yeah. I, and I'll come back when it was dark. Yeah, you know, knackered, come yeah. back, eat, sleep, yeah, do the same thing the next day, yeah. and the next day, and the next day, you know, and 
you just get into this, okay, who, who am I now? Mm. Okay, well, I was Troy Flavel, the rugby player now, but who, who am I now? And you're trying to, you're constantly trying to find that self worth, yeah. and that's what players, you know, when if you ever have a conversation with a guy who's come out of rugby, ask him that question, especially if you're going to do podcasts with future guys, and I guarantee you they'll say the same thing that everyone is trying to find self worth because you've been this person, this persona for so mm. long, you know, and you're popping up the other side, and you're you're just trying to find yourself trying to find your way mm. okay who am I now you know and I don't I don't really think about that at the time I didn't think about that for about f- f- five five six years yeah you know out of, out of popping out the other side and then yeah. when I think back I was like yeah that was a bit of a shit time wasn't it mm. you know and it didn't didn't really sort of um, fall on me until like I said yeah. four, five years down the track and yeah. I looked back and I was like yeah I didn't handle that that well yeah. you know yeah because yeah. it's as a um as like an athlete or as a rugby player, I just find like we're so um, like task driven. Like mm. me and my wife struggle on a few different things because she gets um, attached to. It's mainly when there's like negative comments directed at me. Say they really affect her, but for me, I don't even. It literally doesn't even enter my mind because I've built up this sort of barrier of thick skin because I had to to survive. Yep. So. You know, if you're worried about every negative comment or every post on Facebook or Instagram in a negative way about you, you you you'd never get out of bed in the morning, you know? Yeah. Because you're in the limelight and, you know, everyone mm. has their opinion and everyone can have their opinion now with social media. Yeah. Um, so and it she really struggles with that and she struggles with the fact that it doesn't affect me and mm. it causes tension in our relationship because she's like, mm. How can you not fucking rah, rah, and then I'm like, just leave it because it's out of my mind. Yeah. Like, I don't want to deal with it, but I I don't actually ask, uh, how are you? Are yeah, you okay yeah. with this? You yeah. know, I don't talk through how her feelings of it. I'm just like, shut up. I don't want to hear it mm-hmm. because I don't, I'm trying not to let it creep into me, but I'm mm. actually missing the point that it's affecting her. Mm. Yeah. It's not the fact that she's worried about me. It's the fact that it's actually affecting her, mm. not mm. the fact that she's worried that I'm hurting from yeah. it. Yeah. And that's, that's what we're oblivious to, mate. And, yeah. you know, I'm glad you mentioned that because... At least you're aware. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're, you, you're obviously aware. Mm. You just spoke about it. But, um, yeah, man, it took me years to start thinking like that. Mm. You know, you're, you're still coming out of rugby yeah, yeah. To, to, a de- to a degree. You're, I know you're still in it, bro. Yeah. <laughs> I know you're still in it, but, you know, you're coming to yeah, your, but your twilight, twilight like, years yeah, now, yeah. you know. And uh, so to have the awareness is fucking awesome, mate. Yeah. 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 But part of that too is that more people are, you know, like yourself, I've been able to interact with people like you and more people are more open to talk about, you know, what they struggled with or how it was hard and Mitch fits a good example of that, you know, yeah. so I've, you guys paved the way for my generation and then, the and then, you know, likewise, I'll do the same for the generation that follows me in terms of guys like Quinn, like I mentioned Quinn earlier. Yeah. Yeah, there's all these guys that, you know, like I started playing with, like Marty Holler and Johnny Gibbs and people like that, Isaac Boss, that were all on my team that taught me good lessons and then I watched them transition out and then I dealt with Jono again when he came back coaching and he talked to me about different things and made me aware of, you know, that transition period and how he went through it and what he kind of focused on. So it's, you know, it's there's so much importance in, in listening to advice and share, like also like sharing is passing it on yeah passing it yeah. on but I find the biggest thing the about that is actually listening to it mm. you know I remember when I was a young fellow you go into a team and these old uh, like the experienced guys would tell you things and you're like what does he know mm. because you just got this natural arrogance cockiness yep. that you think you know what you're doing but you actually don't like mm. there's a skill and we talk about it in rugby as well when you're on the field the biggest skill in communication is actually listening to mm. what is being said. Mm. People always say, oh, what could we do better? Oh, we need to communicate better, whether it's defensively or attack. But quite often, it's the actual listening part that's missing. Mm. It's like, oh, I didn't hear a call. Well, the call was made. You just mm. didn't listen. Yep, yep. Yeah. Yeah, well, and that's all forms of communication, you know? Yeah. It's with your partner and, yeah. Business, the rest kids, of the day. You know, yeah, listen, kids. listen to kids, you know, yep. putting yourself in their shoes. You know, yeah. Yeah. you know, quite often, you know, um, yeah, this is an example, but um, my dad, I'm feeling cold. Yeah. 
Yeah. You're not cold. You're all right. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you actually got to um, validate what they're saying. It's like, yeah. oh, you, you're cold, son. Yeah. You sure? Yeah. You know? Or, or not, are you sure? But, yeah. <laughs> uh, or, you know, maybe go put a jacket on for now or yeah. whatever, you know? you got to mm. just validate what they're saying. Yeah. And, you know, same situation with, with um, your your lady as well, mate. You know, you you can put them, put yourself in their shoes and yeah. think of it from their, their side of the bridge, you know? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and it's pretty, well, because we, we've effectively been wired that way to survive in our environment mm. to, like, a large part of, mm. what well, you know, pretty much when you're in there, like, the, you're constantly getting feedback and pressure from coaches or teammates or mm. senior players in terms of what you need to do better mm. and what not to focus on and what to say so you're just like okay i need to go do this task if it goes poorly and rugby we're trained to bin it you mm. know mm. but it's like you're trained to bin it and move on you try and learn from it mm. but there's still that element of forgetting it mm. like as well because you're like i can't let it creep into my yeah, next yeah, action yeah. yeah so it's like it's yeah it's quite yeah. easy to get into a bit we've, of a state we've got that ability to do, do that with it. yeah and that's Get crossed over into real life, right? Yeah. yeah, real life situations where you have something. Yeah, I don't want to hear that, or yeah, or it's something negative. Mm. But generally, when it's something negative, you, when it's something mm. negative, you go ah, piss off, you know? Yep. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't want to deal with that. Mm. You know that I'm just going to focus on the good. Mm. You know, I'll focus on the stuff that makes me happy. Mm. You know, and not address the the shit stuff. You know. Yeah. Um, but as we know, you you know sometimes you need to address that so you can actually push forward you know yeah yeah well it's that being aware of who's around you mm. and how mm. it's affecting them and how they're mm. dealing with things and yeah it's you know it's something that i'm glad that i'm like aware of now but it's definitely taken time to get to that point oh yeah, yeah. oh man i'm st- i'm still learning yeah yeah well, i think <laughs> we, yeah, we all do to a certain yeah, extent you know? eh? like, yeah but i was um like in terms of my career me coming back to new zealand when i did was actually a big part because i was quite fearful of what was going to happen after rugby mm. and i knew the support network so i like i'd spent six years in japan i came back here at 30 yeah i was 30 31 31 turning 32 and i came back because i like knew like oh, i could have searched out another contract offshore uh, and i'm sure i would have got something um don't you know i don't know what but i'm sure i could have but I was like, I had like two goals. One of them was to make sure that I was in a good position for when I retired because I knew that, you know, that was getting closer because I was 31. Mm. But the other thing, like I wanted to be a centurion for Waikato. So that was a big driver for me. I want to go home, want to become a centurion. I'm not too focused on the money side of it. I'm happy with what I've done financially with my six years in Japan. Yep. And now I had a goal when I went there and I achieved that goal financially. So I'm like, okay. Don't get greedy. Now it's about making sure the transition out the other side is going to be better. So I knew that I was going to come home and get paid peanuts. Mm. Um, But I was just like, I knew also the power of the network of New Zealand rugby. And I knew the Players Association and how good they are now at what they do. I knew the network in terms of what Waikato has out into the community in terms of you know, the board members and what they do in society and you're spending time with these guys and you can, you know, with the podcast, these are all successful like CEOs or CFOs and these big companies mm. and I can go and talk to them and ask questions about what I'm doing and different ways to do things mm. and, you know, if I'd been overseas and just come back and then tried to go knock on the door, it's a little bit different yeah, when you've been sort of six years disconnected yeah. from it and the board is different now compared to when I left. But in the fact now that I came back and I dealt with them and seen them, talked to them on a daily yeah, basis, yeah. that network started again. Now we're doing the podcast. Like of, it's amazing the reach you have out into the community and these people that rugby connects you to to be able to lean on for support and yeah. help. Like it's it's a pretty powerful tool, way eh, yeah. rugby in New Zealand. Yeah, yeah, that's good, mate. Well, you've you obviously been through those. Um those years you've spent that years you know those years where you've learned to appreciate mm. that kind of support you know um and you've had that available to you um which you know like we've heard of the wild west the game yeah. you know like we didn't we didn't have that no. we never had that and even think of that no. you know like you obviously had enough of that in your playing years to feel that and want to come back to that mm. You know, for us, yeah, we're, like, you know, we're, we're, we're Harbour guys through and through. You know, Harbour, Auckland, Blues, you know. 
but there was n- that, that affiliation was never strong enough to draw me back. Yeah, you, you know, like it wasn't strong enough to draw me back and in, in, into the country and make me want to play here again. You know, especially mm. in my sort of twilight years. You know, yeah. I sort of done my dash here in, in NZ, and I was more focused on yeah, if obviously financially getting my family secure, uh, making sure that that part of things was okay, but. I found myself searching, you know, once I came out of rugby, like, I went back to building, but I wasn't really enjoying that, um, and I, you end up scratching, you know, I call it, I call it scratching, because you, you, you start scratching at everything, trying to find something, you know, yeah. um, and it's not there sometimes for a lot of guys, you know, yeah, yeah, especially in my era, more so. Yeah, yeah, well, definitely, like, mm. I got that from talking to the guys that packed the park, Mm. Um, you know, like case I talked to Case Muse, and he's like real successful now with his um, real estate. Mm. What he's doing down there in Dunedin, but he was like, "Bro, I don't know what the hell I was gonna do when yeah. I finished." But mm. there's also a side of that. Your and I look at it right through. I suppose your era, like there's a lot of very successful people that have come out the other side, but you always see the successful. You don't see yeah. the people that struggle because yeah. they hide it because. It's human nature. You don't yeah. want to be seen as a failure or failing at whatever you're doing. So you see all the successes and you're like, oh man, these guys are doing awesome. But there's a, there'll be a big portion of people that aren't. Yeah. Yeah. But then also the ones that are successful, no doubt they are successful because they are just, they have that, the reason they're successful as rugby is because they have that, they're wired a certain way that they, yeah. they find what they want to do, they commit to it and they work through it. And they get knocked down, but they'll get back up. Yep. Like, and I think rugby teaches you that. Yep. Like, and the ones that stay in the game for long, long perseverance. Time, yep. Yeah. Resilience. Yeah. yeah. Disciplined. Yeah. Um, just that drive. Yeah. You yep. got that, that drive to yep. succeed. You know. Yeah. And you look um, at that group that played Pick the Park. I listed the names. Yeah. They're, they're like all you know all the greats, and you don't get to there without having that in you. So yeah. the fact that they're successful now outside of rugby mm. is not really a it's for me it's not really a surprise because I know what it takes from being on the inside like I never got to that point but mm. my teammates did and friends did around me mm. and I seen what they went through to get to that point and when you start to get to that that pinnacle like that real pointy end of it everything is a lot more highlighted yeah yeah and yeah. then what you have to push through to get to that last little climb to get to the top yeah the two percent yeah, yeah that little two percent then mm. you're like okay like now i get why these guys are who they are like yeah yeah like you can see why dan carter's dan carter yep yep richie yep. mccall sam kane you know all these Kira yeah Reed, and, 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 yeah <laughs> <laughs> put me on that list um <laughs> Oh, sorry. I'm just getting another beer. Oh, yeah. Carry on. Oh, good, George. Good, George. <laughs> um, yeah, you're right, mate. You're right. Yeah. I sort of lost my train of thought there. That was cold, cold, good George beer this bloody <laughs> took over me. Just jumped out. Oh, something about a can crack into a... Oh, like it. Mate, it's gold. Yeah. Oh, is this, is this the regular one? Yeah, yeah. Do you want to try a little bit? Oh, yeah? Okay. Better, better give it a will. Yeah. I can make a few comments this yeah. evening. Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah, good, George. Yeah. Tasting notes. Um, yeah, still I've got a few words to say to you, mate. Uh, yeah, yeah, talk to the head, bro. <laughs> there you go. If you like it, I'll pull it up. Thank you. It's gold. Mm. Good, eh? So good. <laughs> Shop, I love George. it, eh? Yeah, it's Man, that's really good. Yeah. Show, me, show me the label. Raglan Roast. Coffee IPA. They did it as a limited run and it just went nuts. Wow. So it's like on tap at all their sites now and they've just made it a mainstay. Jesus. Yeah. You can see why though, eh? Oh, so yeah, good. Outstanding. Yeah. Anyway, I'll put that back in the fridge. Where were we? We're talking about Richie McCaw and Dan Carter there. Oh, yeah, just that, um, that drive that you is required you know to sort of get to get you to that point yeah um yeah but like we sort of touched on before it's good to have that drive and you know and all that but sometimes you you 
you blinker yourself off mm. you know from what else is what else is going on around you you know you're so focused you can yeah. b- become so focused but yeah you sort of lose touch of what else go oh here's the dog here's the dog who let you out hello mate <laughs> hello i know who let you out mate. outside get out <laughs> yeah so yeah. It, it's great but to have that drive and that and that that focus that hype the ability to hyper focus like that yeah on what's required on a particular task and become very task driven is um very good um and obviously in rugby but mm. um on whatever chosen career you want to, yeah. you, know, you know, path you want to take as well. Well, yeah, you look at Richard McCoy's probably a perfect example of that, eh? Because right for his career, like he was single, you know. Well, from the outside looking in, he was yeah. single because yeah. to stay at that level that he did for so long, and under that microscope, he obviously had to fully blinker himself and just, you know, he's a bit of an, an introvert, really. Like he had no social media presence whatsoever. He literally, all you saw of him was when he spoke to the media yeah. after a game or after training or whatever, and then what he did on Saturdays. Like, yeah. that was all you seen. Yeah. Like, yeah, and that must be how he survived it, really. Mm. To stay at that level was just, like, fully lock himself in into that zone, like, this is what I want to do, this is how I'm going to yep. do it, and yep. just commit to it. But no doubt a lot of stuff, like, people, I heard it uh, saying the other day, actually, like, talking about, like, sacrifice. So, like, you make these sacrifices. Oh, it was Eric Murray, actually. He was on a podcast I listened to, The Rower. And he talked about, you know, like, people say, oh, you know, like rugby, you miss weddings because you got a super rugby preseason camp or training or a game or and you miss these birthdays because you're traveling and the rest of it. He, and he was the same with Ryan. He's like, that's not a sacrifice because you've chosen that you want to be an All Black or you want to be, you know, rowing at the World Champs. Mm. Like, you've made that decision. Your sacrifice was right at the very start when you decided that was what you want to do and you yeah. didn't want to be a builder or a lawyer, yeah. that's the sacrifice you made. Yep. Now, everything you do there is, what do you call it? He said it's like paying, well, it's basically like paying the toll for, or well, paying the performance toll, yep. you know, for the, you know, what you're putting in. Yep. Is that's, This is part of it now. You've yep. chosen this pathway, yeah, yeah, so it's yeah. not a sacrifice. This is what you have to do yeah. because yeah. you want to be at the top. This is what it takes. So it's mm. not sacrificing anything. You're it's not a sacrifice. It's, it's, that's just the byproduct. Yeah, it's obviously a you know a byproduct of the choice that you've made mm. in the earlier stages. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Which it like to me it made so much sense because <clears throat> yeah. people would say that a lot to me, and I'm just like, oh yeah, but I never thought of it that way. Mm. I'm like, oh, I don't think of it as a sacrifice. Like everyone's like, oh man, you sacrifice so much and this and that, and I'm like. Is it really a sacrifice? Because I don't feel that way because I love what I'm doing <clears throat> and this is what I want to yeah. do. And if you took this away from me, I would be gutted. Yeah, because, yeah. yeah, I've devoted yeah, my life to it. Like, perfect example of that is when I, um, you know, my school year, all my mates, when we turned 21, mm. you know, all my mates were doing yardies and all that. And, you know, as we know, back in those days, yeah. doing a yardie was a big thing. Yeah, yeah. And I remember being in Argentina with the New Zealand Sevens, sitting in a hotel room doing absolutely nothing because recovering from training, mm. spending my 21st in the hotel room by myself. Yeah. And I was happy, mate. Yeah. Like, it didn't bother me in the slightest because I was glad to be... I mean, I was in New Zealand Sevens with Eric Rush and Dallas Seymour and all yeah. these NZ Seven greats, yeah. right? I was, I was part of the team and I was a young fella and... I was like, mate, this is, this is mate, this is way better than drinking piss. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, yeah. we can drink piss now on the yeah. podcast, eh? Yeah. <laughs> Good George. Good George. Good stuff. Um, and oh, you have mentioned a little bit, but I thought it'd be pretty cool to talk about it. And obviously, being like a father myself, and this podcast got pushed back a few times because of the kids' sport. Yep. You know, but like, how much satisfaction or? That like, do you take out of seeing your kids participate in sport? And oh, mate, I'm um, I'm there every week, you know. Yeah, I'm the, yeah all the trainings, you know, every weekend. Um, the kids are playing um, netball and basketball now, which is all, all midweek stuff. Yeah. Um, volleys, volleys indoor, netball's indoor, sometimes. Um, yeah. But mate, I'm yeah, you know, I'm just a proud dad, you know. Yeah. 
Um, absolutely love Mason's it. Mason's just walked in the room. <laughs> hey, Mason. <laughs> you want to be on the podcast, mate? Say hello. No, no, you're kind of shy. That's right. We're just talking. Come, about come do a little rap on the mic. <laughs> come on. Hey, he's gone no. shy. <laughs> you go look after the dog if you let him out, eh? I didn't let him out. Okay. Plus he's tied up. Okay, good boy. Yeah, so, um, well, speaking of that, because this yep. little fella... It was quite just, timely, wasn't it? Yeah, it was quite timely. <laughs> but this little fella just started playing ripper rugby. Oh, good man. And for me, like, I, I get a little bit of anxiety around the boys playing rugby because it's what... I'm known for, if yeah. you know what I mean. So, yeah. like, I hear comments already. Like, so, you want to push the push the pressures oh, on him? Is that, is that what you're saying? No, nah, I don't want to. I don't yeah, want him to. You, go don't, you don't want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want him to go out with the expectation. Yeah. Because of what Dad did, that he should be this or he should be that. Yeah. And I already hear it now because Cooper, he loves it. Like he's into it. He, it's what Dad does, and no doubt, like I, I think that's just the way life kind of works you know because i grew up with dad playing rugby that's all i wanted to do it was like dad playing rugby so i want to play rugby mm. and cooper's the same i tried to push him towards soccer and things like that just to see like just to let him know that he doesn't have to play rugby yeah. and it but nah rugby was it that's what he wanted to do and that you know that's awesome like i love that he loves to play rugby mm. and same with mason he's you know just sort of starting and he he loves it but He's still finding his feet with it. Where Cooper's all in, like he's like this. He loves it. He's pumped for it every week and <laughs> loves going to training. And yeah. he'll wear rugby shorts every day. Like yeah, that's yeah. what he wants to yeah. wear. And um, but I hear comments on the sideline. And I'm like, Cooper's seven. Like just turned seven on Saturday, and he'll he might score a try. They're playing ripper rugby. It's like a second year, and he he might score a try. And then so I'll hear the comment like, oh, he should do that. He's Dwayne Sweeney's son. I'm like what the fuck like he's six like yeah. you know he was five or six at the time yeah. and i'm just like man like and i i kind of fear for what's going to happen further down the track if it makes sense and yep. it's just because yep. all you want to do is protect your kids right yep. like you want them to enjoy and have fun and i don't want him to not to lose the love of the game because of external pressures like i love the game of rugby mm. and i i think whether i was pro or not i would still have that love for it because i just love everything about it and i and I, I, I kind of see it in him already that he loves it. So I want him yeah. to stay in love with the game. Yeah. But not, I don't give two shits if he plays you know, you know what, bro? reserves. Yeah, I know what, bro. I think as parents, we yeah. overthink it a little bit. Yeah. And yeah, yeah we, we want to be perfect parents and, and do, do the best we can for our kids. Mm. But, mate, he doesn't see it. Mm. You know, he doesn't hear it. Mm. And he, he, he probably doesn't see it, you know. Yeah. So you know, I, I don't know. As parents, we like try yeah. and protect our kids and do do the best we can. But man, like if he if he wants to be a rugby player, yeah, he'll, he'll, do, it. he'll do it. Yeah, yeah, he'll, he'll be a rugby player. It's, it's not it's not from um, you know the dude on the sideline yelling out comments like that. You yeah. know, you know. Yeah, well, I think about it. We, we, we get we we get protective, right? Yeah. As as parents, and uh, I remember my son was coming through the rugby ranks, exactly the same thing. Like, yeah. yeah he should do he's a flavors boy you, yeah. you, you know you, you hear comments like that and, yeah. and man, I, I, I couldn't give a shit what he, what he played you know as yeah. far as sport you know yeah. I just wanted to be happy mm. and that's the most important thing you can do and yeah. you know I think as a parent anyway yeah yeah definitely because yeah you see it so often now but and I wonder whether I, th- I thought about this because I worked in community rugby with Waikato and it, there's a lot a big push now around participation and in sport and everything and trying mm. to get numbers back in sport and the rest of it mainly in rugby trying to get kids back into rugby because but for me it's just there's more options now like when I grew up as a kid I didn't know there was anything else apart from rugby or soccer in the winter <laughs> now you got lacrosse and you can play basketball midweek and yeah. this and that like I grew up here in the Waikato like league wasn't even really a thing that you could do here yeah right <laughs> it was like this closed society almost that I learned about when I got to high school but yeah. in Morrinsville there's no, I didn't even know the rules of league. You know, like you grow up, you play rugby or you play soccer. And if you play soccer, yeah. there's um, two teams. But if you play rugby, there's 40. Yeah. yeah. As junior boys, you know, like there yeah. was just a lot. That's what kids did in Morrisville. So it's what, mm. you know, I kind of knew. But now there's, you know, there's lacrosse teams and all these different sports. And yeah. we're multi, 
multi diverse nation yeah. now, and a lot of people, have, you know, from all di- all different countries live here, yeah. and they bring their sport with them, and the, their yeah. kids go to that school, so they're like, oh, you know, they they used to play lacrosse, so they're like, oh, I'm going to start a lacrosse team and teach these kids how to play it, and then it goes from there. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. it's like, and they talk about all this participation and kids back playing rugby, but yeah. there's just more for them to do and try now, and that's oh, definitely, all good. yeah, which is great, yeah. yeah, like even even you know, and I'm a obviously a, a rugby supporter but um rugby numbers on the north shore they're, they're dwindling away mm. you know and, and why is that but it's because basketball was taken over like mm. basketball was huge on the north shore yeah you know i'm, I'm at north shore event center most most weeks and the numbers just keep rising and rising and rising and it's man it's outstanding yeah i love it yeah, yeah. but it's like um and i talked about it like i'd started to mention it there but like there's a pathway to professional sport now. Mm. And like basketball, 100%, the Birmingham basketball numbers is Stephen Adams' effect. Mm. Stephen, Stephen Adams mm. makes the NBA, and then all of a sudden it's like, well, why can't a Kiwi kid from New Zealand make the NBA? Yep. And if that's what you want to do, and that's the sport that you love to watch or you love playing it, yep. sweet ass. Like, if that's what you want to do, yep. go for gold. And who's to say that we don't end up with, you know, 10 years' time, have yep. five Stephen Adams playing in the NBA and then the next and then further down you ten yep. or whatever. Yep. Um you might there might not be another one but like yeah. you know two two girls from my um daughter's basketball team from Carmel they, they uh, both got um basketball scholarships oh, in awesome. America. Yeah. Um Tony Dalton's daughter. Oh yeah. Taylor. Yep. Yeah yeah she, she got a scholarship. Um obviously she couldn't go during COVID but uh I think she's packing her bags now. Cool. And looking at heading over. Um yeah, so there's, yeah, like you said, man, there's opportunities, eh? Yeah. You know, big time. Yeah, and I think the pre- the external pressure from parents too now comes a little bit from the fact that there is a professional pathway. Mm. Like when I started playing rugby as a junior kid, there was no such thing as pro rugby then. Like yeah. you could, there was always the All Blacks that everyone wants to play for the All Blacks, but it wasn't a career path. Mm. You know, even when I started high school, it, it was like just started as a career path. And I remember all my teachers like, there's no way you're going to do anything. Like, you know, you think pro <laughs> rugby is going to take you somewhere. You're dreaming, you know. But I was like... Whatever. Yeah, but I saw there was like a pathway now. Yeah. I was like... And in my mind, I was like... I, I remember when I... I might have been about 16. And I found out that super rugby player... If you make super rugby, you get 60 grand a year. And I was like, oh, 60 grand a year. Like, yeah, that's me. Like, yeah. my mates were like... Um, you know, doing building apprenticeships and they were on like three dollars eighty an hour and shit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, when they, they left school at fifteen, <laughs> sixteen and they're yeah, making yeah. three eighty an hour or yeah. four fifty with a tool allowance or whatever. Yeah. And I was working at countdown and making oh, I think I was making four dollars seventy for packing freezers, you know? Like <laughs> and I was like sixty grand, like shit yeah, like here we go. And I remember I, I found out baby. Yeah, yeah. I was like, I'm going for a run <laughs> And I remember telling my mum, I said, if I make Super rugby, I'm gonna buy you a spa pool. Like that was <laughs> and I did it, you know? Like yeah, I, yeah. I made the Chiefs in yeah. two thousand seven and I remember we went to the home show here in Hamilton yeah. and I walked over to the site and I, I bought a spa pool and I got it sent to, to Mum's house. Yeah, is that right? Eh? Yeah, yeah. And I, I said it at sixteen, you know, and yeah. then whatever it must have been about five. That's well, amazing six years. you had that career path available to you. Yeah, yeah. I know. When I, when, yeah. I, when, I, when I was growing up, that wasn't even an option, you know. Nah. It was an option at all. Being all black, yeah, yep. there was an option. Yeah. So, but I didn't know there was, you know, nah, you could monetize do, that. You yeah, know, exactly. I didn't know there was a, uh, a money spinner. Yeah. You, you <laughs> know, at the time, I, I didn't. You know, nah. but I just wanted to be an all black. Mm. You know, and I, I remember I'd, I'd watch the game of rugby and I'll go out and run for eighty minutes. Yeah. Because you know, that's what they just did. Yeah. So I thought, well, if they're doing it, I have to do it. You yeah. know, and I, I do that. You know, mm. as a kid. Yeah, it's amazing, eh? Because like, I remember when I went to then. So I had this dream of like, I want to be a professional rugby player. I saw, you know, I suppose I went through high school years of understanding that it could be a pathway and then I worked hard for it and then got my chance to play for Waikato when I was 17, like in my last year of school, debut right, on the young, Friday, eh? yeah, debut on the Friday for Waikato and then play first 15 on Saturday. And That's I, amazing, eh? Yeah, yeah, it's a crazy All story. Right. Like, yeah. and But you know, when you're kind of in it, you don't really realize it's not yeah. till you start sharing it with different people and you know we go now 20 years down the track from that happening mm. and then people are like you did what 
and mm. it's like mm. you know the people at that time kind of remember it but it's not saying that long lasts if it makes sense it's not yeah. saying that, you know just 20 years ago nearly 20 years yeah, ago yeah. so people are like oh they don't even know that's relevant now yeah but it wasn't until i played my um 100 games for waikato and they did a few media articles on it and stuff and they were like oh you know like what were you doing in 2002 yeah because that's when i debuted as a 17 year old and everyone's like hey were you only 17 and then yeah so i had this anyway i had this like pathway of i'd, I'd seen it and i was like okay i want to get there and this one doing i got that chance there um with waikato that i pushed through and then make super rugby and i remember we went to an, uh, the induction day um where they get all the first year super rugby players and you fly down to wellington and I remember going there, and there was a big group of us, and I was stoked because, um, you know, four of my mates that we played roller mills together, all on the same team, so Brendan Leonard, Alan DeVelmont, Richard Kahui, and myself, yeah. plus another, Toby Lynn, who we later on met at high school, but those four, Toby, yeah. yeah, the four of us, we all played roller mills together for Waikato Rangers, mm. we all make our professional rugby debut in the same year, so it was pretty... Yeah, pretty awesome to share that with such a close group of mates and then Toby obviously came into that mix through our high school years we played our Waikato secondary schools and the rest of it all together so it was pretty wicked having this group of you know like real tight group of five of us go yeah. down there all together and I remember sitting in the induction and they talked about it because I think at that time there was five teams so it's 250 fully professional rugby players in the country and they mentioned that and I was, here I am thinking like yeah pro whatever that like almost in a way like oh that was you know this is kind of an easy thing to do just full unawareness of how actual how difficult it was because i had my blinkers on yeah. and i was focusing on what i could do to get there yeah. but i didn't actually realize that by the time we got there it was like 250 professional players in the country because if you're playing npc you didn't make enough money to be professional mm. unless you were playing super rugby mm. Mm. So I was just like, and then when they said that, I was like, what? Only 250 of us. And that's including yourself, you know, you're the yeah. Blues captain that year and all these All Blacks and everything. And you're like, holy shit, there's only, yeah. and we're all kind of looking at each other like, holy shit, there's only 250 of us. And we're looking around the room and there's about 40, you know, yeah, like yeah, in there. Yeah, like, 40 oh, already. Yeah, 40 already. And there's only another 210 of us out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah oh, it yeah. kind of blew me away. Like, yeah, yeah and I was yeah, it was I remember that, and I remember it vividly. Like it's a real, quite a it was quite a humbling moment for me yeah. to actually take it in and realize, like, holy shit, you've done pretty well to get to this point. Like, yeah, yeah. You want to, and I remember they said the average career of professional rugby player was two and a half years. Yeah, yeah that's the sure. average, yeah. and I was just like, oh, okay, it's not long, and it's still the same now. It's mm. pretty similar. Like mm. people think. Because you always remember the ones that play for a long time. You mm. never forget the one years. Mm. And the guys that play a season with you. Like, yeah. as yep. a player, you do. You remember them. But yep. the public don't. Because they. Yep. some guys get a super contract and never play. Mm. But they, you know, they might be contracted for a year or two years, but yep. don't get a game. Yep. Or play one game. And then they're never heard of again. But you, you always remember, you know, like the Troy Flavels, the Carlos Spencers, the um, Johnny Gibbs... Marty Hollers, like these guys yeah. that play for multiple seasons. So you think, oh, yeah, it's a thing that happens for you get in there and you make it and you play for a long time. Yeah. But you're only remembering about 10% of the players. Yes. That, yeah. The cool guys that stay in there because they're yeah. the ones that are doing yep. all the media. They're the ones that. Oh, well, I'm actually quite surprised. Oh, like, I knew, I didn't know that mm. statistic. Yeah. 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 But that makes sense. Eh? Yeah, oh, actually... yeah. It totally makes sense because, you know, when you start thinking back into the, you know, the players that you've known for a couple of seasons or, you know, sort of entered the frame for a little while and mm. got injured or went overseas or mm. yeah no it's pretty cool all right well we're just coming up on what are we just coming up on two hours pretty good yarn bro was it two hour yarn yeah mate an hour 57 now four georges later yeah four georges later and a bit of raglan roast and a few more to come mate we've got the <laughs> we've got the party tonight you and if you're still listening to this too all the listeners get um 10 percent off on good george online i'll put it in i would have already put it in the the front end of this as well but yeah real tales before you check out on the online store and save 10 percent. thanks for having me along sweets no nah, thank you very much for coming troy it was um yeah i was pretty excited to do this because yeah, like I said, I actually thought you were a bit of a 
a dickhead back in the day because I hated Harbour, I hated Auckland, I hated the Blues, but right. you're actually a good bastard. You're not so. too bad yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, cool, bro. Thank you. Right. Cheers, bro. Shop, bro.